This podcast cannot and does not contain medical or health advice. The medical or health information is provided for general informational and educational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional advice. Accordingly, before taking any actions based upon such information, we encourage you to consult with the appropriate professionals. We do not provide any kind of medical or health advice. The use or reliance of any information contained on the podcast is solely at your own risk. All right, and welcome back. So, as we had talked about on the last Where There Is No Doctor, uh, we had finished chapter nine, and we're going to be splitting chapter 10 into two parts. Um, this chapter is first aid. There's a lot in here. There's some interesting stuff in here. Um, definitely dated. Uh, most definitely dated. Uh, some, yeah, there's some, we're going to get to it. There's going to be some weirdness going on and some of their suggestions and some of the stuff that they talk about. Um, <laughs> so uh, starting off with basic cleanliness and protection um and this is the first kind of weird thing um and and um pp is important wearing gloves is really important i didn't do it enough when i was uh early on in my medical career if you want to call <clears throat> call it that um my time as a medic early on you know it was kind of like i'm too cool to wear gloves like that's how that's how cool i am it was yeah. dumb and it was stupid uh wear gloves they're important they're to protect you um well, not, not yeah not to not to contradict that but your use case is different than what they're writing this to this is true um, but, but even like wearing... even clinical stuff we were just like i don't need to wear gloves to do this it's like no man I mean, if you're if you're, you're touching just... drugs yeah yeah but it's like as far as your patient population unless you were doing like rescue work or something if yeah. you're working on national guard troops they're pre-screened i mean the likelihood yeah. of them having yeah, okay but there's the stuff that they can pick up out in town <laughs> But the likelihood the, the likelihood of them having an issue is I'm guessing way lower than yeah. in Mountaineer. Um, yeah, this is true. Um, but still it was just it was it was a bad habit to get into, is is more over like generally it's just for the most part it's a good idea that if you're you're interacting with orifices and or you're like using a needle of any kind, it's just smart mm -hmm. to to wear a glove um this talks about yeah. using a clean plastic bag if you do not have gloves which yeah. i think is very interesting i i would honestly get more frustrated with the lack of dexterity mm -hmm. and would just end up taking the gloves off um i mean it depends on what you're trying to do so if if, if you're literally just trying to apply pressure you can do that with a lot without a lot of dexterity i don't True. know I mean, there. Now this is a very, very austere solution, I guess. Um, but yeah, if it's just trying to apply pressure, yeah. There was actually a, 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 a I think it was a trauma surgeon on one of, on one of the overlanding channels, and he was talking about his trauma first aid bag. Mm -hmm. And um, on the outside of it, he puts packs. He puts like a like a rolled up pair of gloves. He's like. As soon as I get these on, I can now go to work. I don't have to have anything else from my bag. I can apply pressure. It's like I've got my protective equipment. I've got my gloves on. I can have got yeah. that protection. Now I can just do something as simple as put my hand on a wound and apply pressure. I was like, yeah. oh, yeah. Um, so anyway, so. Mm. Yeah, no, that's that's I, I, I mean, won't, I won't knock this entirely. It's just it's contextually driven, you know. Pressure can work. The problem is, is that like how they teach direct pressure a lot of times for like first aid is often wrong. Um, and in the, the earlier, the unrecorded uh, Zoom classes, um, <clears throat> we uh, we kind of talked about this with like the direct pressure that's taught as direct pressure versus like true 
direct pressure, like pressure over top of a wound isn't going to do as much as you think it is versus pressure directly on the source of the bleeding. Um, and that's where like wound packing comes in and not just like stacking up four by fours on top of a, a cut. Um, I mean, this, uh, the subject of direct pressure came up even on like, it was the neck, it was the second to most recent PFC podcast. And they were talking about uh, pelvic fractures yeah, uh, or public pelvic bleeds. And he's like, so if I've taken a round to the pelvis and I've got an unstable pelvis and you're telling me I should drop a knee on this femoral artery on an unstable pelvis. Yeah, you, um, not a good idea. Yeah, that's for, I, idea. for the. I know Kotze has 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 gotten away from the um the knee. Mm -hmm. Um, but that was that a was, thing for a while, right? Yeah, it was. I mean, that's how I was I was taught initially, and it was like it, it wasn't just like oh, gently place that. No, it, you were dropping, and when I say yeah. drop, I mean like Monday Night Raw, like yeah. But from the the top rung dropping yeah. a knee I mean that makes sense until you take a a, a fractured pelvis into consideration yeah and for mm -hmm. us what we were taught um like later on um was to assume pelvic instability if you had any round between knee and right. the belly button like just right. go ahead yeah. and if if, yeah. if something hits there for what we're messing with um yeah that that makes it's sense. a safe assumption because right. your potential to do harm is pretty significant. Did yeah. you ever get a chance to do the uh, pressure point lab at the last Soma? No, I did not. Um, okay. okay, I knew you were signed up for it. I couldn't remember if you, you got. Yeah, there. that was the one. One of the ones that I missed out on. Um, okay. But yeah, anyway, so just tangent there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, protect yourself from bloodborne pathogens, and and you know, for for the, our audience, were you know, yeah, you're you certainly thinking about taking care of your kith and kin, but in order to have legitimacy in the community, you may be doing relief work. Yep. As well as just to be, you know, decent human beings. Um, and those are, again, you go right back to assume nothing. Yep. You know, I almost said proton pump inhibitors. Oh, personal protective <laughs> equipment. <laughs> it, it's close enough, you know. Um, proton, pump and, proton pump equipment. Um, yeah. So, like, clear, clear eye pro, gloves, um, Depending on what you're concerned with, like a surgical mask will keep stuff out of your mouth and 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 nose. If the if you're concerned about squirts, squirting stuff, I think a face shield probably be a better. Um... You do run the risk of looking like uh, that one dude. Um, yeah, a face the sec shield def. is actually not as useful as one thinks because the splashes that come underneath them are insane. There are face shields that come up from the bottom, though. Yeah. Like actual like chemical face shields. Um not just like the 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 cheap shit that they hand out. Like the actual like legitimate like I'm handling very, very strong acids face shields. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Um, okay. Um so, I think the important thing that, that's brought up here is is washing your hands with soap and water. Um that man, you want to talk about surprises from COVID? Um, the fact that we had to tell grown adults, I like working in pharmaceuticals, I was like, you know, we're already supposed to be washing our hands like all the time. And it was just like the fact that we have to remind people after they use the bathroom before you go make drugs after to wash their hands. Body, after you go make boom boom, <laughs> wash hands before you go make drug drugs. Um, but um, yeah, wash wash your hands with soap uh, often. Um, I, I will say that was a big improvement in my uh, one of the things that I noticed to my difference between college and medical school was dudes actually wash their hands before <laughs> leaving, <laughs> we're leaving the bathroom. It's like, <laughs> all right, well we got there. It took it took way too long, but we got there. <laughs> Oh man, so um, select, it's kind of like putting the grocery cart away, guys. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, Another so on on that note, like you probably don't have enough soap. Um, yeah. and 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 the bar is gonna. It may not be as preferred as the liquid soap, uh, but it's probably gonna last a little bit longer. Um, it'll yeah, it'll store better too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. Is that it's, it's just gonna it's, it's gonna store easier. It's it's yeah. less compact or more compact, not less compact. Um, 
it, it requires less space to put up. Um, you can get like multi packs of of, yeah. of dial, and you can um, stack yeah, those. That's, that's what you. I think you've talked about that before, as far as just being able to get it for cheap. And I think we've done the same thing with some of the 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 big box stores. Yeah. Um, what did we see? We were looking at. Yeah, I think something some of the stuff that we got was is it Dr. Bronner. No, that's liquid. Um they make barb Dr. Bronner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me take a liquid. The Castile out. soap. Castile um, soap. That's what we'll buy like a, a pack a variety pack of that. And mm-hmm. that lasts a good long while. Yeah. Uh, let's see. La di da. Technical term. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that was actually something that I was listening to uh, the the guy Blake um, uh, from uh, Blake Water, I think is his YouTube yeah. channel. Yeah, um, he was on uh, the ECT podcast and he was talking about just like the value of soap um, and the value mm-hmm. of like dry soap for your hair. Um, isn't that the term? Dry, dry shampoo. Dry shampoo. Dry shampoo. Thank you. Yep, yeah. I have use that in the field i am not too proud to admit it um you get like yep. a week with no shower your hair starts I getting have, a little greasy i have not um koala bear has used yeah. some of that and she's she's been fairly pleased with it i think i mean i also have a lot of hair i only wash my hair every two weeks right so you're so not like so I it will, doesn't crack on you yeah i will dry shampoo it intermittently in between if i just want to make it look better slash not just have it pulled up all the time yeah so i don't know that the i don't know if dr bronner's is the best price or not i'm looking at like it's not 90 no. cents an ounce a dollar an yeah, ounce it's, it's a little bit more expensive um there are some other castile soaps you can get uh kirk's that's what we use to make our laundry soap uh, we make our own powdered laundry soap oh uh, what's what is this called kirk's kirk's k i like, like captain kirk like the captain Kirk, Kirk's Castile soap. Okay, looking at it now. I don't know how the price that is. is um, that is sixty-one cents an ounce. Yeah, so or it's, if it's, you buy it, or if you buy it in larger, it's forty-two cents an ounce. Yeah, and so we, I mean, we you it. can get it at Food Lion, Walmart. Um, that's most of the time where we where we get it from. Just because it, honestly, the and and I know there were going to be people screaming about buying stuff online and it's so much cheaper, but like just simply the convenience of like, well, you know, maybe I don't want to spend $200 on a, you know, half ton pallet of soap to get delivered to my house to then resell for six months to make my money back. Like I just need like a couple bars of soap. And so if I can do that every time we go to the grocery store and just like throw a thing, like a three pack into the cart, every time we go grocery shopping, it might not be the most like in bulk sense. That's the whole on. That's the whole uh, thing between, like, do you buy? Do you do you make purchases in you know incrementally? Yeah. As you um, you know, like it's like okay, just go buy what you already have. Just go mm-hmm. buy extra of it versus buying in bulk. And honestly, I think it just comes down to, at least pre massive inflation, it came down to when you know what can you afford when when is when is there a i'm just give give you that's just a shorter link if you want to post it yeah um, like so generally speaking if there was a big if there was a good sale and you could you could get something extra of something great otherwise you just bought it in marginal quantities that's not bad at all with the inflation nowadays I mean, anything, yeah. I, anything I buy is a bargain compared to my dollar's buying power in a few years, if not if I, if not sooner. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. But like that, well, those are the two typical ways, basically marginal, small marginal purchases or large bulk purchases, either as a group buy or when there was a sale. Yeah. Or when you pan or, or when you'd panic to a sufficient degree. But yeah so so, um, so it's good yeah not that you couldn't mean not yes you can learn to make it your on your own but you know for sure um you know yes i I, I love when people are like well you could just make your own this and you could just make your own this. it's like how much time do you have available 
Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I, and I don't, I don't mean this in like a derogatory sense. I, well, I, I say that I kind of do at the same time. It's, it's always retired boomers that are like, wow, you just learned how to do this. And well, why don't you just learn you know. how to do that? It's like, look, man, I, I already go to work and then like, I have like hobbies and I have family and I have faith and I have like other things that take up my time. I don't have 52 hours in a week to devote to my new hobby of making yeah. soap for three weeks before I get oh. bored. And move on to the next one. We're definitely getting off track, but I'm, I'm just gonna <laughs> go a little further. I think part of this is some of it's kind of a founder effect because when you look at Rawls, because Rawls got a lot of people into this, right? Yeah. And very much of the you know be able to do everything school of thought. Yeah. And when when you are a when you as a prepper are a tiny portion of the population. And you can't expect anybody to be able to, 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 to be able to have, you have to be able to do everything yourself. Okay. Um, with the, in, since COVID, you know, we've got a lot of COVID preppers now and some of them are still sticking in the game. The argument that the game has changed and yeah. I'm kind of, I'm kind of coming around to, a, I feel like writing up an article or, or just a, maybe just put something on the log cabin school for all six people to listen to. Um <laughs> I appreciate those six people, um, but something is something to the something to the defense of uh, of like in de, you know in defense of specialization and like you don't do it all. Um, yeah, if you have a skill set that already is useful and is already you know recession proofable. Mm -hmm. uh, focus on it, you know, like yeah. focus on that um, rather than trying to be able to do everything because. Is it in an ideal world? Sure. But it's a whole lot more economical to purchase beans and rice and all this other food than it is to spend all the time and money and energy into being able to maybe making yeah. small increases in your food supply. Um, I mean, if you if it gets to the point where you put aside several years of food and you go through that and there's nobody to get food from. There's bigger problems. There, you've got bigger, yeah. You've got bigger problems. Yep. Um, I mean, I, I think a lot of this is more just it's more like having a nest egg as far as like it gets you where you have some flexibility and yep. you can adjust. Bargaining chip. So you're not yeah. stuck. Yeah, absolutely. Um yeah, it... I used to be like super anti specialization and then like I started learning crazy. Um, I'm like, man, like there's just like, you really can't like, there's no way. And like, this is where it's, it's, I think it, a lot of the, the, the do it all kind of stems back to like this rugged individualism. And we've talked about this before as being like yeah. a problem that like, yeah. you can't, you cannot do all of it like it's just not possible and like this is where like community is really important because a strong community can come together and like you don't have to worry about like doing all of the things and having a cow and chickens and sheep for wool or llamas it's, and like getting in all of this like you can just have like okay look like we have some chickens and we have like a couple goats and we also do like this other thing you know, like with medical or yeah. whatever it is. And then you have, you know, other members in your community do other things and that community comes together and you um, like the true basic capitalism, like exchanging goods for other goods and services. And all of a sudden, like all of your needs are met. There's no need for anything else. And everything is handled at the lowest level possible. I mean, his, you know, in this country, even people who had like certain professions or trades or whatever, I mean, they still probably had a garden. They still hunted. Yep. They still, were still able to work on their own cars. I mean, we are so far on the other end mm -hmm. that it hurt people to 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 make an effort to to get some basic capability. I, I'll grant you that. Um, so there are some things that I grew up because we grew up relatively. I don't say poor, you know. Well, I didn't feel I like at the time, but yeah. Um, there are things I know how to do that I just assume that people know how to do, which I which they don't. <laughs> so, I, okay, I, I realize I have a blind spot there. Um, but so going back to the whole individual thing, the cult of the individual, I think what we need to, what I need to, 
I can speak for myself. What I need to clarify is the rights of the individual. It's like, yes, absolutely, right? Sure. Depending yeah. on the rights of the individual. That is not the same as you individually have to do everything for yourself. Yep. Right. So anyway, uh, that's just sidebar. Yeah. Um, Way far. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. It's what they come for. Um, they should expect it by now. So, getting into fever. Um, oh. Fever is not a sickness, but a sign of many different sicknesses. A high fever over thirty nine Celsius or over one hundred and two Fahrenheit can be a sign of a dangerous problem, especially in a small child. Um, and then it says to, you know, let them trying to uncover them especially for small children they should be undressed completely and left naked until the fever goes down do not cover kids up with blankets um that to wrap up a child with a fever is dangerous i've done it to myself it's probably not the smartest idea to sweat out a fever but i've done it a couple of times and i mean there's no i, I say there's no obvious like deficiencies but there's probably a couple yeah <laughs> um well, I, the, the thing is like so so a you're an adult not a child so your purpose area to volume is is different okay. and you can make that decision right? yeah this is true so when you've got a dependent human that can't tell you it's like i'm I, he's like this is getting out of hand or whatever um yeah. Now, as far as taking a fever seriously, Koala Bear, can you comment on kind of the age where you start to really, I think, I want to say three months is where you really get concerned about a fever in an infant, around. other way around? They are under three months, they are septic and dying until proven otherwise. It's one of those you do not mess around with at home, and it's like, it doesn't matter, it's like any higher level of medical care if that child needs to see someone. Yeah, that's... That's what I meant. It's Under like th three months. Yeah, three months is kind of that 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 threshold where if it's below that, you get really concerned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they are anything over thirty eight Celsius or one hundred point four Fahrenheit, that is a real fever, and that is sepsis until proven otherwise. Yeah. Um. After that, you can start doing Tylenol, cooling, managing it at home. You do not do ibuprofen until they're over six months. Um. Uh, not that there's anything particular that we know of that will go wrong. It hasn't been studied in that group, and the kidneys in that group, which is what ibuprofen gets processed through, don't work very well. Uh, they have not grown up. They don't have to process hardly anything, and they're not expecting to get hit with the medication. Yeah, we've talked about how ibuprofen constricts down the blood vessel to the kidneys, yeah. and, and then that's that's part of what, what the, the problem is. So I, I just appreciate you you quantifying that because. They just say like small children, like in small children, and then like I wanted something a little more yeah. specific. No, um, it, yeah, just the the under three months is when you get real concerned. Um, with with older infants and toddlers into uh into young school age kids, you really get concerned about the rate of rise of a fever. Mm. Um, it doesn't matter how high it is; it's it's very difficult for the human body to get high enough to actually cause damage with a fever mm -hmm. uh you're, you're not going to harm anything below the nasal bridge i promise you um no matter how high that fever gets you're, you're not going to get do permanent harm um what you get concerned about is cooking the brain mm -hmm. and it's it is almost impossible for, for the human body to intrinsically get that hot i'm sure there's some tropical diseases out there that would prove me wrong but as far as the garden variety things that most people in the western world are going to ever reasonably encounter uh even in a worst case scenario reasonably encounter <laughs> you're you're not you're not gonna get a fever hot enough to to actually cause brain damage but what you get concerned about in those in, in the older infants toddler age is the rate of rise where if they go from 97 to 102 in half an hour you have a problem uh, not that it's going to cause permanent damage of itself or even temporary damage of itself but that's when you start seeing febrile seizures is that when you start getting into heat shock protein I would have to look it up. Because I, 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 I remember that it. being a, a messenger of like, I just remember that that protein and heat shock protein. But I, yeah. I'm, now I'm just I, I would have to talking it. off the top of my head uh, and I shouldn't do that. But, but yeah, <laughs> when, when, you're, when you're crossing multiple degrees Fahrenheit inside an hour is the rough, roughly when you start worrying about febrile seizures. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of those that's like most of them, again, they're fine. 
you'll let them ride it out. They're at higher risk for a repeat seizure during that same illness, but not during a subsequent illness. Yeah. But it, it, but you can have the ones that go very, very badly and have permanent damage. It does underscore the significant, again, one of those things we've talked about a lot of trending vitals. Yes. Just much. in general, yeah. trend, but trends are important. It's like, yeah, yeah. It's a wild toddler and they're just looking pinker and pinker and pinker. And like you, you need to be checking that temperature frequently, yeah, um, and cooling them actively. Gotta love the peace sign this kid's throwing up. Um, I'm assuming that that's what that is. Um, just little <laughs> front ears. The uncovered child. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Either that or he's doing the British equivalent of the bird, uh, <laughs> which is very possible because they refer to uh, acetaminophen as paracetamol. So you know, maybe we should take that as maybe. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, much. Um, and we have drink lots of water and then it says juices or other like i, I it's just, I, it's juices like not recommended because it's just a bunch of sugar isn't yeah, that kind of yeah. like a, a bad and we talked about this one during diet the whole diarrhea discussion too like mm -hmm. juice be avoided because i guess of the osmotic effect yep. yeah. yeah 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 i would say like something like bone broth would probably be like a better you gotta say that correctly Bone broth. Oh God! I can't do it. Like <laughs> I'm not even going to attempt it. Anymore. <laughs> I'm not even going to attempt it. I don't um, attempt to do it anymore. <laughs> um, you don't need to go buy bone broth from people. That is as much as I'm going to sound like a boomer right now. That is something you can make at home very easily. You get the rotisserie chicken from, you know, Costco or Sam's Club. You rip all the meat off, and then you can just boil the crap out of that carcass and they won't we didn't come with any and <laughs> what we get quite literal with the word crap it's like i have questions for the butcher <laughs> oh um, man so, but yeah. i am i am trying to he's trying he's trying. i'm trying to be good and not say words that i shouldn't say i'm trying to correct efficiencies yeah. So my question is, will the bone broth turn the frogs gay? That, that's that's my question. Um, it depends on whether or not you use fluoride water. Um, okay. Okay. That's gotcha. Gotcha. That's right. that quantifier. Um, and then obviously the last thing, when possible, find and treat the cause of the fever. Um, I feel like for some of those, like it's just gonna like for most. I guess like URIs that most people like are familiar with being like a cause of a fever. You're, they're just going to run their course. Um, I think it, it depends on what the cause of the fever is. Yeah. I, I it do does say when possible. Yeah. I mean, the other thing with elder, like elderly people, particularly uh, like elderly women, the other potential is UTIs. While we're on the UIs, uh, mm -hmm. urinary tract infections. And the yes. thing with elderly people is they are not likely to mount as robust a fever response I, anyway. I mentioned that it's like if you're finding a true fever in an elderly person, an elderly patient, like something they're, they're in bad shape. Yeah, the, it's is not. Yeah, you, you got to be more suspicious of fever in them because yeah. they're not likely to mount as robust a fever response in the first place. So if they mm -hmm. are, something's more seriously wrong. Yeah. All right, very high fever. Yeah. Um, Over 40 degrees Celsius. Yeah, put the person in a cool place. They're, they're really they're real fans of removing all clothing. Um, hey. Yeah. And, and fanning the Love subject, here. which might explain some of that Wikipedia article we saw. But anyway, oh. um, <laughs> moving on. Uh, yeah, so. Cloth so, soaked in cool water. Yeah. Um, um let's see it's... i would also add putting them probably in and i don't know if that would i mean if it's cool water it's probably not going to be a problem but putting it in the uh the junctional areas so like groin and armpits as well to kind of yeah. help gradually cool down because that's with any sort of like temperature change that you're trying to inflict on someone you want it to be gradual which we will get into more in uh, a couple pages because i've got some some stuff to say about things they suggest um, so, we'll just leave it at that for now. On the um, opposite side of this for hypothermia, this again was one of those things that came up in PFC. Mm -hmm. They were talking about like doing a you know a catheter catheterization of the bladder and then warming the urine warming the urine back up and then putting that urine back into the bladder. Sterile saline, guys, that you're asking for a UTI to put the urine back in. 
Wow. That's well, hey, that's why we have her to pen him. But yeah, so then everything, thinking... not just a hammer, everything is a sledgehammer <laughs> in our bag. <laughs> oh, gosh. We need to rapidly oh. rewarm this guy. Why don't we just put his pee back in him? <laughs> like that's like you have like bear grills like down here like the next like like ascended <laughs> tier of, of bear grills is not just drinking your own pee but using oh, a catheter oh. to warm it back up oh uh, so, so warming it back up and so then using this, a catheter to put it so back leads, into your bladder so this leads to the next logical question or something um do if you have for some reason the combination of hypothermia and dehydration do you warm the rectal fluids before you yes. administer it so that's a thought i yeah i would honestly yeah. um yeah passive warming regardless of hydration level yeah yeah um but also the the warmer fluid is going to be absorbed and processed faster than than cold fluid yeah because mm -hmm. um, your body has to warm it up to temperature before it can process it, it has to bring it to core temp so I thought I, I know it's I know it's kind of the opposite end of the temperature spectrum, but I thought, oh, while we're on this, we'll talk about like, putting, putting someone's pee back in them after we warm it. Of course, you, you can't like listen to witch doctors and get angry when they do witch doctor things. <laughs> <laughs> it's the it's the, you know the Charlie Day from uh, it's always sunny in Philadelphia where he's like got like all the pictures with all the like string connected, oh, and he's like got the fun? cigarette and he's like. All right, guys, listen. <laughs> is that where that's from? Okay. Yes, yes. Um, I've seen the freeze print. I've seen the the still the still picture. Yes, but... that's where that's that's where that's from. So the important thing is gradual temperature change. Uh, cool water, uh, not cold water to drink. If they're conscious, <laughs> if they're conscious, uh, which we're going to get into, uh, because uh, we'll 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 briefly go over this. Uh, under twelve, it's safer to use acetaminophen. Over 12 aspirin to help bring down the fever. Um, and then there's dosage for acetaminophen using 500 milligram adult tablets um, using a tablet cutter. I don't know if I would try to cut a tablet into eighths. That's a little. Do you have an eighth on there somewhere? Yeah. So my oh. dosage for acetaminophen using 500 milligram adult tablets is patients over 12 years, two tablets. Every four to six hours, children eight to 12, one tablet every four to six, three to eight years, half tablet every four to six, one to three years, quarter tablet every four to six, and then babies under one year, eight tablet every four to six hours. Okay, I do not have the babies under one year. And now just, just to be clear, is it is it is the tablet a 500 or a 300? 500. Uh, okay, mine is the 300. Okay, interesting. Huh, that's probably why. You have you have the PDF or something? Okay, you're just listening, no, and I'm not listening. listening. Gotcha. Uh, so hmm. if I I will I do want to make a correction because I know that this guideline came out after any of these additions. Um, it is every six hours. You do not dose Tylenol any closer than that. Um, and you do not increase the dose for the fact that it's at six hours. Like that is like there was too many cases of accidental Tylenol poisoning by dosing at, at every four hours. All right. So it is one of those like we do it in the hospital on occasion when we can keep exact track of how much Tylenol they've gotten. Yeah. But don't do that at home. <laughs> so do we do it? No. Because if you were doing, oh gosh, if you were doing 500, let me see, for persons over 12 years old, 500 milligram tablets, you said two tablets? Every four to six hours. Every, that's a gram. So every four, so a gram every four hours is. Six grams in a day. Six. Mine, so mine does also say do not give more than four doses in 24 hours. Okay. It does have oh. that qualifier. That's that's there is there is that years. little like it's four, not an six. asterisk, it should be, but there's that little it should be in bold, honestly. No, with, that with is all the not, stuff that's that in bold. is not on mine. That um, is and, and then the next the next little subparagraph that I have, um, which I am very I have words. Um, if a person with fever cannot swallow the tablets, it gets worse. Grind them up, mix the powder with some water, and put it up the anus as an enema or with a syringe without the needle. Oh, it works. Um, okay, so if it's an enema, <laughs> <laughs> I 
I don't think you understand the word enema. <laughs> if you're looking for like absorption, that by definition is not an enema. You need some salt in there. I mean, we've talked about how like the Spanish words for things are different and everything, but yeah, enema. <laughs> I mean, I, I won't hate on it for. Yeah, I won't hate on it for administering it anally, but the word enema. Yeah. That's words. Words are words matter. <laughs> yes, words mean things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's there's that. Well, that was. Was uh, we're, we're, we're so we're, all, we're too pedantic. We're all over the place. <laughs> uh, and I'm um, yeah, I'm too pedantic. Yes. And then we have shock, uh, life threatening. Pedantic oh. illustrates that. Right. Yes. <laughs> uh, life threatening condition that can result from a large burn, losing a lot of blood, severe illnesses, dehydration, or severe allergic reaction. Heavy bleeding inside the body, although not seen, can also cause shock. Yes. Um. Yeah. Any 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 loss of 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 blood. You know, you you lose enough. I think it's like a liter and a half, and you you run the danger of uh, I, I'll say a liter, um, especially internally, because um, there's probably some sort of external loss too that's not being included in that. That's you're you're getting to the grounds for hypovolemic shock. Because what do you have? You have uh, five liters of blood total. Four to five, depending on age, gender, um, body type, and a couple other like genetic variances depending on like um like where on the planet you're from you know people are built differently um so, so it's so four to I, five so, so, so i'm dr levine taking care of a trauma <laughs> patient all i need to do is if they're down a certain amount of blood if i've got a female that's down a certain amount of, of blood all i need to do is say well she she identifies as a man therefore she has more blood volume he has more oh. blood than he started with so we're good anyway this is what they call uh, a pro game remove so i did hear something on the pfc podcast on like burns and iv administration they were talking mm -hmm. about using um basically saran wrap and then they like up then they went even further and they were talking about some sort of wrap for like tattoos i i, I don't have any tattoos so i'm yeah. not sure I'm it's a little stickier apparently because it's designed mm -hmm. to for a while and the idea was you're going to protect that iv site and yeah. potentially hold in on burned skin uh protect the nerves and pre hold and prevent you know, in. Yeah. Loss, loss there was the caveat that you might be you have an increased risk they didn't name the bug i think they i think they were talking about pseudomonas i believe is what they're talking about because pseudomonas aeruginosa is one that's known for causing problems in cystic fibrosis patients mm -hmm. and burn patients because it'll film it'll it'll form a biofilm yeah um, so anyway that's a that's a separate discussion but that was just like oh that's interesting um, yeah that yeah. makes sense um yeah. i've just been listening to them recently so yeah um, and we have signs of shock weak rapid pulse and they list, you know, more than 100 beats per minute in an adult, more than 140 minutes for a child over two years, and more than 190 per minute for a baby. Those are very rough guidelines. Um, don't get hyper fixated on a specific, and I've, I've said this a thousand times, and I'm going to say it a thousand more. Don't get hyper fixated on one specific vital sign. Treat your patient as a whole. Like, nah, treat the numbers, the patient <laughs> I mean, we could just, we're just pretending to be assurance adjusters at this point. <laughs> we're just treating the monitor. The patient is a necessary um, accessory to the monitor. Cold sweat, pale, cold, damp skin, blood pressure drops dangerously low, and they don't define that at all. Um, mental confusion, weakness, or loss of consciousness. So let's talk about it for a second. Let's, let's talk about it. Okay? <laughs> they didn't. Let's talk about it. Um, Fair. Because who knows? Um, Vitals yes but i'm gonna i'm gonna just touch on it. a couple values okay shock index because they're not going to talk about it the shock yes index i've written this down before but i'm gonna write it down ratio, again okay the shock index is used by not by me but by actual people who do critical care um the shock index is a ratio it is on the um 
the casualty card. Um, and basically what you're doing is you're taking the heart rate and putting it over the systolic blood pressure. That's your top number on your blood pressure. Most pe most of us walk around with a with an, an uh, a shock index or an, a ratio of like 0. 0.5 to 0. 0.7. That's kind of your normal range. When your shock index gets to be one or greater, which is to say, your well, for example, your heart rate is now 100 and your systolic blood pressure is also 100. Um, and you're not crying, you're not upset. This is like your, like, there's no emotional element to this, right? Your heart yeah. is rising uh, because of that. Um, as your heart, so uh, what happens is your blood pressure drops, your cardiac output drops with it. And so your heart rate increases as the body tries to maintain that cardiac output. Mm -hmm. So that's, so the shock index, that's your, that's, that's one thing, quick, quick and easy thing to look at. Okay. Yeah. The other one is your MAP or your mean arterial pressure. Mean is a overly educated word for average. Um, for people who really wanted me, median, and mode to all sound the same. <laughs> um, so a MAP is an average of your systolic, your top number blood pressure, and your diastolic pressure. But it's not quite that easy as just taking the middle number in between them. Yeah. Because your heart in your uh your heart rate cycle, your um your, it, your heart spends about twice the amount of time relaxing between beats as it does squeezing, beating. So you weigh that diastolic number, that bottom number, twice as heavily as you do the top mm -hmm. number. So if you can you want to do the math one way, you can multiply that bottom number times two, add it to the systolic number, and divide the whole thing by three, or you can go, you can take your top number and your bottom number, and you can go about a third of the way down toward your um, toward your bottom number. And that should get you, excuse me, no, a third of the way up. Is that right? Yeah, a third of the way up from your bottom number should get you to that same average. I believe I, I believe I described that correctly. Yeah. I, remember writing this down. I remember writing this down in class and I had I, I had misconceived it. I misremembered it. If you were in any doubt, multiply two two times D plus S divided by three. Divide the whole thing by three. That'll give you your map. And then what you're going for is some guidelines say, like the emergency war surgery manual says uh, a map of greater than 60. Um, more recent uh, podcasts that I've listened to, uh, they talk about greater than 65. Okay. Um, okay. I'm confused. Yeah, I mean, I guess so, but that's just the just just kind of the rough the the target number that they've that they've thrown out there. Yeah, um, it it depends it depends what you're trying to perfuse and how well the body's doing. If you're talking, you're in a shock state, you probably need to aim for a higher map. Um, like if you're in a shock state and you want to make sure you perfuse your entire central nervous system, including your spine, you need you need a map of eighty. Hmm. Um, uh, I would argue that the, probably why theirs is lower is for our use case. And I say ours, if I'm still wearing a uniform, um, for a military trauma use case, we have to be like super concerned with blowing out clots, especially like the non-compressible hemorrhage. So, so we want a lower trauma. map because <laughs> yeah, we're that's... shooting for a systolic of a hundred anytime we level and just saying it's like some, some you do need to keep in mind it's not the end all be all for yeah for yeah, now yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a good point though i mean they're what what mac is talking about is yeah. the is the permissive hypotension that surgeons talk about yeah. mm -hmm. but um i'm getting did you hear this from the neurosurgeon uh something else okay um but that's that's interesting um so again it's just like well in order to prevent massive re-bleed and, and lose the patient entirely, we're willing to risk mm -hmm. their neurologic, their, their spinal neurologic status. But yeah. that's, but it's that temporary. Is it's not long-term. That is a very short, that is, yeah, that's, it's just for trying to get them to like, it's sustaining life long enough to get them to someone that can get that number higher. Mm -hmm. Um. That's yeah, and, and you know, yeah, that that hypoperfusion. I mean, any anybody, any like any surgeon, even if you're doing it for 
you know, any surgeon will say like, yeah, the ischemia and hypoperfusion is not good. It's not, yeah. it's, 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 we're in, we're in, uh, we're in limp home mode, right? We're not like where we want to yeah. be we're trying to, it's, it's a stopgap measure. Um, yeah. But anyway, now that I've, now that I've beat that up a little mm -hmm. bit, so they're dangerously low thing. That's, that's good to add that in. Um, I'm relearning how to do that math. Um, so what to do to prevent or treat shock? Uh, loosen any belts or tight clothing, have the person lay down, and they tell you to put them in the reverse from Dellenberg. I, I've i seen stuff that that says it it really, like reverse from Dellenberg, doesn't do anything. This looks like Trendellenberg. Trend I'm sorry, Trendellenberg. I might have that backwards. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, gotcha. Trendellenberg with, the, you know, laying down with the feet elevated above the heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really not as beneficial as we thought. Um, some of that might be like why it's still continued. One just could be people just don't know. Another thing is that it might, um, you know, there might be a little bit of placebo effect that someone thinks it's doing something and not just for the person, but like family members, bystanders, like, oh, they're doing something. Like, mm -hmm. I've seen that in medical shows. I know what that is. Mm -hmm. um, eh, I guess. I but. Mean... Uh, it's it's not going to hurt anything to put them in the unless they have a head injury. There is that clarification, um, especially mm -hmm. like with the concern of intracranial pressure. We don't want to increase that at all. Um, right, right. Yeah. So this has them sitting in a seated, a half sitting position. So kind of like propped up. Degrees. All right. So they talk about the So. Let's look at the, how they define this shock as in from or resulting from large burn, hemorrhagic lo lo loss of blood, mm -hmm. illness, undefined, uh, dehydration, <laughs> severe allergic reaction. Okay. Heavy. Yeah. And then internal hemorrhage. So none of those are talking specifically about a TBI. Uh, and the closest thing might be a severe illness, like maybe an encephalitis. Yeah. I don't know if that would, I don't know if that would put you at risk for increased acp yeah it just okay. on mine i don't know if it doesn't say it on yours but mine it does say however if he has a severe head injury put him in a half seating position half sitting position yes yes it does it okay. does yeah so that's yeah I, that, that's, um, that's okay and then we have stop any bleeding use gloves or plastic bag to keep the blood off of your hands if they feel cold cover him with a blanket if he's on if he's conscious and able to drink Give him mm -hmm. sips of water. If he looks dehydrated, give a lot of liquid and rehydration drink. If he does not respond quickly, give IV fluids if you know how. No. Mm -hmm. um, IV fluids, I if someone's conscious, I'm always going to have them drink water. Um, that's just from what I've been taught and how, like what I've seen. Um, it ends up being a waste. And especially for us dealing like in an austere setting where you only have like put so many bags and resupply is going to be a problem. I'm not going to waste an IV bag on a conscious person unless I'm using it to push some sort of medication. Um, counter, I'm going to, I'm going to offer a counterpoint and then counterpoint my counterpoint. Right? <laughs> um, so typically if you have, if, if you think this person's headed for surgery, you're going to try to avoid giving them anything orally. Yeah. Cause they're going to be under general anesthesia, most likely. Now my counterpoint to my counterpoint is, the likelihood of being able to do general anesthesia versus some sort of local anesthesia Doesn't is matter. far less. So the NPO trying to say if you're sedating at all. Okay. So let's say if I was doing ketamine or, or yep. spinal. Yep. So the NPO time is the same. Really? To, okay. To avoid aspiration risk. Okay. So it's, it's, oh interesting. Cause if you're because if you're numbing, you're numbing at that level board. anyway. You yeah. still have aspiration risk, even yeah. if they're conscious. And, you st and any kind of sedation runs a huge, huge nausea and vomiting risk. And yeah. it's, it's way more than we think about, but it's it's there. Yeah. Um, okay. So. All right. So my count my my yeah. counterpoint to counterpoint is is invalid. My original counterpoint yeah. stands. Uh, the the the, ca the caveat to that is if you give them if you give them something that's clear liquids only, so water, Pedialyte. Really, in that circumstance, like mm. Pedialyte, 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 actual Gatorade would be better. You want the solute load. Mm. Uh, you want the highest solute load you can get in a head injury. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You're trying to mimic 3% normal saline. 
Yeah, because you're trying um, to pull pull fluid off of that through that through the blood brain barrier. Yeah. Um, and they, yeah, they that hypertonic. To clear mm -hmm. liquids is it's a two. It, it is ideally four hours, but realistically two hours before general anesthesia or uh, or, or sedation time. And push comes to shove. If you have the resources to put them under that kind of anesthesia, you can drop an NG tube and evacuate their stomach. Yeah. If yeah, if you're if you're that sophisticated, yeah. Yeah. And we do it yeah. all the time. We don't bother keeping them here. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So I guess yeah, it's going to depend on what's your expectation. I mean, if you it obviously. Yeah. It's right, just specifically about. for dehydration. Um, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. For dehydration, I'm not going to give some. If they're conscious, I'm not going to give somebody an IV. Right. Um, to protect their airway or two different things. Yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah. If they're unconscious, yeah, I'm. I'm gonna. You know, if I if I can't do rectal, if that's not an option for whatever reason, um, I'll do IV. I'll I'll do that for dehydration. Um, because there's probably other things going on as well. Um, because we probably also like with unconscious and dehydration um after i've treated heat stroke which we'll get into it's in this chapter it's in the first half of this chapter that we're doing my primary focus um for free hospital is treating the heat stroke so treating like the temperature in their body once i bring that down then i'm going to start worrying about the dehydration but my primary concern is to cool them off not to because you don't want to give cold iv bags that used to be something that we would do and there's a lot of evidence showing that that's actually not because it's rapid cooling mm. and it can cause more harm than that's good because you're pushing them the other way now instead of just gradually cooling. So just a, like a room temp bag is is more than enough to cool somebody off internally, but I'm not cooling them internally. I'm going to cool them externally and then I'm going to push fluids. Um, Something but that that's I want... just that's yeah, we'll get yeah. to that. Yeah. Something. What? What? Why? Uh, I've got my own ideas on this, but why do you think they say do not give a sedative like codeine? Not a trick question. I just I just wanted to see. Uh, if mean. they're conscious, you want to keep them conscious. Yeah. So and and if they're going to have a change in their mental status, you want to know yep. about. It. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if I would limit that as much as possible, that's where like for for EMS and for pre hospital trauma, like pain's not a problem until the casualty or patient makes it a problem. Um, because like what that level of consciousness tells us is a lot. Um, yeah. we don't have like all the fancy sophisticated machinery stuff to tell us things so we have to rely on other cues to tell us stuff. Yeah. That's just something I think a lot of people would not, they, they wouldn't yeah. make them comfortable, but you're relying on them being able to tell you how they feel. Mm -hmm. they, if they have a change in mental status, that gives you information that's going to be masked if they're already snowed. Yeah. Sort of sedative. Um, so you balance that with like trying to not make this hell on earth this for this person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You need to give some angiolysis because uh, you might have someone hurt themselves worse if they're, yeah. even if they're fully with it and alert, yeah. the situation that they have found themselves in can be literally overwhelming. Yeah. And I think there's been some discussion on the PFC podcast for like pain control just to, avoid the formation of like the really traumatic memories of this whole thing yeah that's no, yeah that's true yeah pro yeah and that's and that's sick they won't remember it yeah kind of avoid or some of those over the risk of them remembering yeah it. yeah yeah that's some of the undocumented and unproven benefits of ketamine that they're still trying to figure out it's hard to study stuff like that um yeah so there's um yeah. That. well that's that's like um i can't remember what i i know there's one of our discussions we were talking about this but there's studies where it's like things that are hard to study because i think it was the vitamin c trial uh -huh. it yeah. was becoming so obviously a good idea that it was ruled um it was ruled inhumane to, to continue the trial because of the of, of the controlling because yeah. the control group was was so, uh, was disproportionately not doing as well. So right? to to give some background on this, a number of years ago, EVMS in Virginia, a, a teaching hospital, medical school, um, one of their intensivists inadvertently noticed uh, anecdotal evidence that their that that their patients in sepsis in the ICU who were on a home vitamin C that just automatically got continued upon admission. So that's usually what you do with benign medications uh, is you just hit, hit the continue button on the computer. Uh, those patients did a little better. 
And so he started tinkering with it, managed to get an IRB approval to do a study on giving actually really large doses of IV vitamin C in sepsis. And it was hmm. such an overwhelming benefit that the study was ruled unethical to continue uh, because the control wing did, that didn't get vitamin C were and were being treated by all the usual methods of managing of, of managing sepsis uh, did not hmm. just look poorly by comparison. But That's the interesting. Is they could not make a formal recommendation mm -hmm. to use vitamin C mm -hmm. because, because they didn't complete the study. Right. Yeah. yeah. So this is when that's when, so wow. This is where, yeah. like, when you say, "Oh, there's no evidence, or there's no study, or there's no," it's like, yeah. Sometimes you really need to quantify that. Like, yeah. you need like, yeah, that's maybe this wow. is an exception to the rule. Possibly, I yeah, I, I'm not a research guy. Yeah, I, I but. I'm, yeah. There are exceptions to these rules where it's like, all right, quantify. When you wow, say there's that's... no evidence to support this or there's no studies, man, no completed studies to support this or no studies, like, all right, I need you to quantify that. Yeah. Because yeah, the, the, that kind of thing can happen because of the way the rules are set up, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that every time somebody says there's no evidence that they're that they're just, you know, making stuff up, but as Scout likes to say, or says says often, whether he likes to say it or not, <laughs> quantify. <laughs> you know, like use yeah. a, use a not don't just use quali. Qual he's talking about encryption usually, but you know, don't use qualifying language. You you use quantify what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because like Man. that, you know, when people talk about use qualitative terms for things that really need quantitative terms. Mm -hmm. It, it yeah it it makes my hair itch um man that's interesting man i'm gonna i'm gonna think on that that one's gonna that's really the implications of that like and, and that's I'm not saying, oh, demand that your loved one in the icu get vitamin c whatever watch it, me it's not a, an appropriate use for it yeah it, it's yeah it's just a little bit of an in, just a little insight huh. into how sometimes these rules are made yeah that's interesting that I, I, another interesting, like you, you continue with this tangent a little bit, like interesting thought experiment, like, like, wouldn't that also like, therefore just imply that like, there doesn't need, like the study doesn't need to be continued to, to cause that recommendation because you just said that it's unethical to not provide the no. IV vitamin C in high doses. No, because there wasn't enough data to say that it was extrapolatable. Yeah, I it's just like I said, just an interesting thought experiment. Like in that, to say that it's not ethical to continue because they were doing poorly. Like it's, I it, it's it, for people smarter than me to have that like the ethics discussions that I'm not very well versed in. Um, that doesn't. I just thought that was interesting. I mean, com com from my perspective, like common sense would would indicate that if if you're at a point where you have to where you have to make this decision to discontinue the study mm -hmm. then i don't know if automatically is the right word but there should then be pro some, some sort of protocolized all right well we need to then continue on with this like it, the, the it answer be reformatted yeah and done as as a different kind of study and yeah. i don't yeah. know lose track of it i don't know the, the, what the outcome was the, the answer is not we will never speak of this again um, <laughs> the initial reaction because getting an irb back on your side when you've had a study deemed unethical to continue is like not going to happen and the irb um, is uh basically the approval body yeah right yeah it's the approval body to allow for experimentation on human subjects mm -hmm. sorry yeah the internal review board or institutional review board that's what it is okay um and it, it's not only for humans, but in medical context, yeah. It yeah. Is. Uh, We're only interested in one species. But <laughs> just because you because you've had that label put on something that is like yeah, cut off. You're you're not getting approval for <laughs> another one. You're just not 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 at that institution. That's yet. unfortunate. Um, there might be some again, probably some exceptions to that, but it's yeah. Terrible. So what I the the last I knew about this was basically is like well. There, you can't make a recommendation for this protocol, but if you, but there's nothing stopping them from publishing the study. Yeah. And as a limited case report level study, mm -hmm. and it certainly gives other clinicians the ability to have shared decision making with patients and family. Sorry. Sorry. And say, would you like to attempt this? 
And then if you eventually collate enough data in individual case levels, then you can actually get a body of evidence to make a recommendation. It takes bloody forever, but it, it's, it is a thing. That's I interesting. Don't that, like, I don't know exactly how, like, okay, I lost track of the study. I don't know exactly how that yeah. would go, but that would be the, the easy yeah. next step on it. Hmm. I, I, yeah, I, I really want to, I, I'm, damn you. Now I have stuff, more stuff to read. And I just <laughs> read part of a study and, or at least a thesis. And <laughs> now I have more stuff to read. <laughs> Making my library bigger, not smaller. Like, if you're going to, if you're going to get this much education, you want to be getting some kind of certification. <laughs> <Yes>. from it. <laughs> Not reading your thesis and critiquing it or making you defend it. I'm sorry. The, the, the Stuck Pig Academy of Medicine. <laughs> Here by um, the So now we have if the person is unconscious, lay them on their side with the head low. Basically recovery position. Um, it's, it, it's a good thing if someone is in shock and, and they go unconscious. Or really if they go unconscious for any, any reason. Um, if it's feasible, put them in the recovery position. Um, having spent time in two branches of service, I've, I've done this a couple of several times to people, putting them in the recovery position after we get them back to their either barracks room or the tent at AT, um, even though we weren't supposed to be drinking because we're under general order one. Um, but yeah, it just the, the recovery position is just a really, it's, it's just, it's cheap insurance. Mm -hmm. um, says do not mine says do no give him anything by mouth until he becomes that's actually, conscious so, yeah that's in my copy too uh well some editing issues apparently made it through um no harm or give. if do, you or no someone give. nearby knows how give intravenous solution as a fast drip or at a fast drip um i need a t-shirt do no I, give. do no give <laughs> let me write that down i've got so many do no give with like a sombrero but with like a codicus on the sombrero there you go, <laughs> there you go. um uh, so i will with this give intravenous solution at a fast strip i will give the caveat if it's hypovolemic shock related to blood loss Let's let's not do that. If we have the capability to do fresh whole blood, let's yeah. let's do fresh whole blood. Um, you're you're gonna like it if you have preferred read this part of the uh, the thesis we've been looking at. Mm -hmm. She's a huge champion for whole blood. Yeah, it's especially on the soft side. It's like the benefits of it are are insane. When I was doing the the blood lab at Soma, um, what I thought was, and it's not feasible for us really, um, but for them. For conventional and non-conventional, I would argue it's it's feasible um, because they have dedicated supply lines. Um, what they would do is before they would go out on mission, they would pre-poll um, Oneg blood. And if they didn't use it when they got back, they would just give it back to the person they pulled it from. Mm -hmm. I want um, <laughs> which is in it's that was like I was like, holy shit. Because like now you don't have to be like, well, I got this bag. I got to do something with it. I want to just give it back to the person I gave it to. And now they're back up to a full status. They're not like on light duty for three days. They're they're back up and ready to go. Are there any, um, is there any uh, like vitamin regimen that they put them on after after a I like orange juice and cookies is about all I ever got from Red Cross. Uh, not that I know of. Um, never it's never been talked about at my like the levels that that I've been involved in. Um. I just eating and drinking. You just you just have to wait for the, you know, the the blood to get replaced. Um, that's why for them they just push that blood back. Um, and then, um, which I just thought was really really cool, but just not really feasible because that's that's using a lot of blood bags. But interesting if you do have the need where you like something is like going to be happening and you like need to pre-plan at all for something really super serious. Yeah, um, I mean, you but... have that that capability blood aside from other like medical supplies were in one category and blood was its own category mm -hmm. so, trained personnel evacuation platforms blood and medical supplies like those are the four um yeah 
prints that she that you know she specifically listed as far as knowns. Anyway, yeah, that's um, a different episode. We have loss of consciousness, common causes of loss of con- loss of consciousness, drunkenness, hit on the head, getting knocked out, uh, shock, seizures, poisoning, fainting, heat stroke, stroke, and heart attack. Um, and then it goes if the person is unconscious and you do not know why, immediately check each of the following: uh, breathing, uh, losing a lot of blood shock and then heat stroke are the four that they list um what you're doing is you're you're doing a trauma primary survey it's like yeah do, do they have an airway are they breathing they have circulation they have do, do they have some yeah. kind of injury um and are, are they neurologically intact but yeah i mean you just, you're checking the abcs um a b c d e yeah <laughs> um yeah, uh, this is all. This is like I don't have a problem with 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 any of of the stuff that they've listed. Um, um, I, I I said it in the background, but another thing to keep in mind with um, with unconsciousness is is DKA or or the like. Um, if you if you have someone who is either a known diabetic or a kid that has suddenly become one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It uh, it is under the the fainting. Um, it does list uh, from fright, weakness, low blood sugar, etc. cetera. Um, but yeah, DKA is definitely like that's a for us austere too. That's going to be a huge thing to like, like deal with. Um, and if you haven't thought through how you're going to handle um, diabetic issues, like, oh, gosh, I mean, yeah, it's and not that I'm saying like, oh, I need to pre-plan how to get insulin. Like, no, man, that's not oh. what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like end stage of care. Like you need to have like some fucking thoughts on on what you're going to do when people are like, I don't have any more of my life's needed medication and I'm going to die within a series of days. Yeah. Well, I mean, what are you going to do? I will say low blood sugar is typically, at least these days, it's typically from having taken your insulin and then not eating and not eating, taking your usual insulin and then not eating. Or not mm-hmm. um not to say that like you get far enough into diabetic ketoacidosis and you're not going to be like altered or have lost consciousness yeah but yeah common things being common yeah but common things now versus common, to common <laughs> yeah um but yeah no those are like and that's not just for diabetics but there's there's a lot of of medications that are taken to facilitate life that um that might run out so Mm -hmm. that's if if you know people like that that is a conversation you need to have now rather than later um and it's 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 a very serious conversation it's it's a hard topic to broach i i understand but it's one you have to have um yeah I'm, i mean it's yeah, yeah it's I, it's I, that, that yeah that is a conversation you've had yeah it's 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 hard it's tough um it's i i bring it up in class and it's 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 mm, it's a very sombering moment when it gets brought up um because we go from kind of like lighthearted and joking and having a good time to like outside of trauma a lot of very good people are going to die that's yeah. just that's it. I mean, going back to this this the, this uh, gorilla medical system that I've been reading about this thesis, yeah, it's very clear that it's not oriented toward taking care of grandma. It's not oriented mm-hmm. toward taking care of anything other than trauma and specifically combat trauma. Yep, that is yeah. all it's oriented to. It's not going to. It's it is. It has a scope. But... Yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah. It's not about hearts and minds or no. taking the civilian population and yeah. and even then you're extremely you you could you could potentially be very extremely limited i mean you're looking at mm-hmm. and when i listen to these these young guys uh talking on their podcasts about this or this or that and i'm just picturing like these are the guys that we're talking about you know non-compressible hemorrhage mm-hmm. and, you know like possibly losing limbs, potentially losing their lives if mm-hmm. you don't have the medical infrastructure to take care of them. And even if you save them, there could be scarred and, and carry those scars for the rest of their lives. Like they would not have the appropriate rehab to be fully functional, close to fully functional. I mean, it is yeah. sobering. It is sobering. I mean, it's like, I'm going to continue attacking this problem, but 
it yeah. is so sobering. Um, it's it's sobering, but it's also motivating at the same time. Um, because yeah. it, it like it shows you how important it is that there is, and we talked about this pre-show that there's there's this gap in like prepper medicine. Um, you have and and I'm not I'm not talking down at all in any way, shape, or form because the stuff that's been talked about by people um, is extremely important. Um, like the the doctor bones and the nurse Amy, and then talking about all of the like the general like these first aid things. And some of the common illness things like a lot of people that aren't in the medical field at all don't know how to handle these things. And so it's important that there's qualified people talking about that. But there's a gap, though, because on the other end of the spectrum is people that are just like, well, you know, if you can't replicate, uh, you know, fully uh, electrical and, and, and compressed air and gas surgical center it's it's pointless and there's there's no need to worry about any of this and that you know ifax are just to to allow somebody to live long enough so they can go home and say goodbye to their family it's like there's there's a middle ground between these two things there's and i'm not saying that we're going to be able to recreate that surgical center to its full capacity and capabilities but we can mimic close enough that we can like recreate like world war one or world war two era surgical capabilities without a lot of um i mean to go um, back to what dr lyons talks about in her in her concept um it's it's the you're not basing your system based on its capabilities you're basing mm -hmm. your, your system based on what needs to be done yep you know so yeah again, the great illustration of it's like don't really you know, like the guy with a broken arm. I don't really care. It's not life threatening. It's like yep. I don't need to be worried about. Oh, do we have X rays or blah blah blah? It's not life threatening. Yeah. Um, and we're just trying to do very simple. I mean, and that's and that's like that's a U.S. Air Force special operations adjacent emergency medicine doctor of seventeen yep. years experience saying, "Look, in a clandestine environment, in a denied environment, this is the best you can do." Mm -hmm. is deal with life threats yeah um, so anyway i mean again i i i really appreciate what the what what the albums have done and i think mm -hmm. they've covered so much already that that needs to be talked about and so we don't have to do that like yeah that's that's cool i, I you know i don't have to reinvent the wheel excellent so we can yeah. you know, kind of build off of build off of that work that's already been done yeah, standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it, it leaps and bounds ahead of stuff we need to cover and stuff we can we can get through and have these conversations. Um I'm I'm really excited to get through that paper and and, and we'll be doing a, a a review episode um on that because there's there's a lot of really important stuff that's that's brought up in there and no one else is talking about it. So we'll be the ones we might might be the best qualified people to talk about <laughs> it, but no one else is, so screw it. We'll just like some of the other stuff that we've talked about before, like nobody else is is talking about these things. If 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 someone else were to come in that is more qualified, by all means. Um, but the I, the I may not have the qualifications, gentlemen, <laughs> but I have a mouth. Um. Yeah. Um. But... <laughs> um. Sorry, because so partially because I enjoy needling you, partially because it does need to be said. Mm -hmm. Um. I have not read as much as much of this background as either of you have, but from what I have seen, there's as far as as far as home care, uh, just any kind of any kind of independent independent medical care for common things are common. There's not nearly enough for common things are common. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's it. There's not in nearly enough detail or nearly a broad enough spectrum, particularly, and I will beat this drum because I'm a pediatrician, there's not enough for for kids, infants, neonates, prenatal, like that that is that whole spectrum of maternal fetal pediatric medicine is a neglected field when it comes to when it comes to self-care. And there are things that I straight up will say when I'm doing my opinion, like a febrile infant under three years or under three months of age needs to see a higher level of medical care. Like I will draw that line in the sand, but but it's also it's like, you know what? There's a whole lot of things that are not that that are not a life threat like that that are handled way differently in a specialized population, like in, like obstetrics or pediatrics that is so different than your average adult. 
Yeah. And just needs to be expanded upon. Well, yeah, I, I think, uh, I think I speak for Mech as well on this, as far as like why I say the, the very complimentary things that I do about the Altons is like, I don't want to come across as like, ah, oh, they just don't know what they're talking about. You know, like, no, like they, they've done yeoman, yeoman service. Yes. But what I'm saying mm -hmm. is don't write off dealing with and doing education on the common things are common. Yeah. And that, that's yeah, why absolutely. I focus on that because I, it's like, I see this from a specialty perspective yeah. and it's so easy to treat someone inappropriately. Like the number of times I get a child from the ER who's treated by an adult ER doc who's like, I haven't seen a kid in five years and I'm flying by the seat of my pants. Yeah. is a little scary. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, a lot of the, going back to this thing with, with the, you know, Dr. Lyon's paper, the whole premise is that you can't short of short of consigning your casualty to imprisonment uh, you know, and arrest mm -hmm. you can't really send them to higher yeah. Yeah. conventionally no I, yeah. I, I understand that just yeah. it's like there's a whole lot of common things are common that could be built upon more and it still has room to grow yeah this is kind of like calm the comms world i mean except yeah. i would argue um there's just always something more to yep so much to explore yeah. um all right so loss of consciousness yep and then we have how to position we have shock and fainting trend allenberg and then heat stroke stroke heart problems head injury we have the reverse trend allenberg with the head elevated um so yep yeah yeah, they even say like heart heat stroke stroke heart problems head injury now with the stroke i'm what that's interesting i'm wondering i'm I think that's yeah. a, you're, on you're the 13 chance that it's a hemorrhagic because if it's ischemic it's not gonna it's not a problem right yeah you're not hurting anything but if it's hemorrhagic no, you're fine. you don't want to you don't want to have a gravity assist to bleeding yeah. into your skull yeah your brain um so then we have when is there any chance? Uh, what's in this? Any chance that the unconscious person is badly injured? Uh, best not to move them until he becomes conscious. If you have to move them with great care, because if the neck or back is broken, any change of position may cause greater injury. Now this is something very different than the that. philosophy that's taught for for combat medics, right? That's from what you told me. Yeah. So and the reason for that. Um, there's a lot of, and it's shaking up EMS pretty bad, like civilian side of EMS. It's, it's kind of one of those hot button issues is like the backboard um, mm -hmm. and C sign C spine stabilization. Um, mm -hmm. Because the thing was everyone was getting put on a backboard and they weren't doing it correctly. Mm -hmm. um, including people that didn't need to be on backboards were getting put on backboards because the idea was, is like, well, if you know, it's just safer to just assume and just, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, but you also have to like, you can't just strap someone down to a backboard. Like you're supposed to use padding. Yeah, you have to recreate a, natural curvature of the spine. And they were doing that. Zero, it's not a zero risk. Uh, yeah. Um, there, there is risk to it. And it's, they've, there's been studies that have shown increased rate and mortality to being put on a backboard um, and that a gurney offers a, an ambulance, let me clarify, an ambulance gurney provides enough rigidity for them to do good quality CPR. Yeah. Also, with the advent of mechanical automated machines that are doing the compressions for them, it's less of a concern. Um, they also have things that they can just slide underneath the back of their patient to perform mm -hmm. the CPR reps. Um, yeah, I've seen those. I'm going to send you these. I'm going to put links over here. This is stuff that I saw on ebay um yeah just interesting i think mm -hmm. but a little this is just on gurneys that i found on ebay yeah it was like check surplus hmm. um interesting yeah um, like big tires for when you absolutely positively have to take your gurney through the mud yeah um, um so stuff. what i will say on for why we're not like we do have protocols in like the military for handling c-spine injuries um and stabilizing we have backboards we like we do all the especially mechanized like that's a concern vehicle crashes rollovers falling off the top of a bradley um because i think it's any height or any fall that is more than uh two and a half times the casualty's height we're automatically suspecting c-spine injuries um the concern is is that when it becomes a trauma issue 
I'm more focused on the more immediate cause of death than the complications from C-spine. Um, and the way it was put to us kind of jokingly is that the army pays people that cut open other people to fix problems. Let them earn their money and focus on what you're paid to do. And what we're paid to do is to handle the traumatic issues. Not saying that we completely ignored C-spine, but that if it was like we were concerned with things and loss of life, limb or eyesight in that order. And then like and then other issues. So yeah. like if it was like, you know, lose a life or potential risk of back issues down the line, I'm going to save your life. Neurosurgeons got to work too, huh? Yeah. I will make them earn their, their, their paycheck today. Uh, um, yeah. So that's, that's kind of where that comes from. It can get dangerous to where people like just don't. And I fell prey to this a little bit where you just don't give a shit about it at all. It's still important. Um, there can be like very serious complications. And if you don't need to move someone, don't move them. I've come across a car accident and like it airbags deployed. That's kind of like my like big box to check as to whether or not I'm like moving somebody and, and mm -hmm. airbags most definitely deployed. And I'm like, yeah, hey, let's just everybody just chill out and relax. Is anybody bleeding? Everybody cool. We're conscious. All right. Let's just let's wait for the professionals. And yeah. that's generally and, the best move. Um, yeah, that, that's that's kind of was what I was doing when I rolled up on that one scene. Yep. Um, like, yeah, just was loving seeing the fire from the fire truck come over the hill. Like, oh yeah. And then like, I'm just, I really want. As long as this guy keeps breathing, we're good. Mm -hmm. we're good. As as still find a pulse. Still get a pulse. Cool. I don't have to try to do compressions sideways. <laughs> <laughs> car seat. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, yeah. All this guy out. Yeah. And it's, but, it's, yeah, the, yeah. I was really wishing I had a neck brace at that point. So I have gotten some neck braces. Mm -hmm. um, brace and a C, C collar, a, excuse me, a C collar. I've gotten C, I've got the, I've got the um, multi, multi yeah. collars, which are not terribly expensive if you don't have to be tactical. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can just get plain ones, ones for, yeah. yeah there's the tactical ones are just a marketing gimmick for the army the to buy them because everything has to be od green for the army to buy it um yeah yeah i mean i guess i could put my real tree duct tape on mine no. you could just rattle can it um and then yeah so the army wants it od green the navy wants it with with rainbows and unicorns um okay. and a pride flag um mm -hmm. so then we get when something gets stuck in the throat um Basically, just doing the, um, you know, pat him on the the back of the. You know, this is wow. That's interesting. Um, the first step this do or they they recommend is basically doing the the infant um. Object stuck in throat thing where you like grasp like their their chin and their head and like you cradle and smack their back for adults if they're making like the universal choking sign which is like they're they're holding their neck with their hands mm -hmm. um just go ahead and go straight to the uh, the heimlich don't worry about trying to like pat their back if they can like it just it doesn't cost anything you just go straight to the heimlich if you can do it properly um which is pretty simple obvious but make sure ask them in so many words are you choking because i <laughs> That symbol made that I've done it myself with shortness of breath. I got pepper sprayed accidentally on a windy day, just disposing of small pepper spray. Yeah, I kid you not, like that. I didn't even realize I was doing it. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That is. <laughs> yep. That's. Yeah. That is a good thing to bring up. You. You ask them, "Are you choking?" It's like and... it sounds stupid in the AHA training video, but it's <laughs> <just, laughs> God, I love those videos. Um, uh, what was the Michael Jackson? Uh, Sally, are you okay? Are you okay, Sally? Yeah, because that was apparently from the old, uh, <laughs> the, the old way of they did the training. Like this, the model was Sally. Oh and God, so like, Sally, are you okay? Are you okay, Sally? Like that's where that came from. Uh... That line, hmm. and was, there was a little vignette about like a cop doing a, you know, walking up on a scene, and like this, this was so ingrained in his head. <laughs> He's like talking to the victim, Sally, are you okay? Are you okay, Sally? <laughs> <laughs> priceless that's amazing um and if, if they're so also if they're uh pregnant in a wheelchair or small children or if they're just really really large um place your hands on the chest not the belly 
Uh, and if they're a lot bigger than you, or if they're already laying on the ground or unconscious, just lay them on the ground and, and push that way. Um, and if they're unconscious, tilt their head to the side so they don't looks like a modified re aspirate. Um, and then we have drowning a person who has stopped breathing has only four minutes to live. Act fast, uh, start mouth to mouth breathing at once. Um, so I will say, and it doesn't really, it talks about like, unless there's no, at the bottom of the next page, unless there is an open sore or bleeding in the mouth, it is not possible to give or get hepatitis or HIV from mouth to mouth breathing. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so, uh, regardless of whether or not they have that, they're going to vomit from rescue breathing and compressions. So use a mask with a one-way valve because, um, as much as I don't enjoy my own vomit in my mouth, I really don't want somebody else's vomit in my mouth. <laughs> that is uh, straight up not having a good time. What's that? You never know until you try. <laughs> no, that's just How do you know? yeah, no, that's it's not like ketchup. That's just one of those things that I don't. This is not San Francisco I, EMS. Okay. Yeah, I, I know I don't need to try that. Um, and then when breathing stops, mouth to mouth breathing. Um, so what I wrote, the only thing that I wrote down here was it made me, I, I wanted to bring up um, this because this is definitely an older, an older book, you know, it was written in the seventies. A lot of stuff has changed since then. Um, now we're doing for responders, like untrained responders are doing compression only CPR because the most is correct me if I'm wrong with this, but the most common reason why people need CPR for grown adults caveat grown adults why grown adults need cpr is because of like cardio issues like their heart's not working correctly now with kids it's different most of the time it's because of airway or breathing issues um that they need cpr um i had to make sure i get that caveat like loud enough for everyone to hear it um because i don't want to get yelled at (laughs) (laughs) gonna hurt your feelings yes (laughs) um (laughs) But I know for untrained first responders, they're pushing this whole like compression only so much so that like in every airport now, right after security, there's a little training model. That's a little chest where you can like hit the interactive button and it tells you how to do CPR for compressions only. Why not? Yeah, I'm like they had it at SeaTac, they had it at RDU. Like it's been at a couple airports that I've flown through. Um, I think Utah at Salt Lake had one too, because um, the AHA is trying to push this like. You know, not everyone has like carries around a one way valve mask, which you should um, at least like the simple little like plastic sheet because they make them in yeah, little things you one, throw on your keychain. I have um, one of those in my ankle rig. Yeah. And um, now I will also say most AEDs and most keyword being most do include at least the mask portion of a BVM and the masks are ones that will interact with a bvm a bag valve mask um and those also have one-way valves in them so you don't get the the vomitus into your mouth um ventilate you can tell if you're not ventilating effectively it's like yeah. it, it just won't squeeze that's something that i i i, I was asking one of the one of our uh, local cops here is like if they have aeds in their vehicles and uh he was not he was not familiar with that he, he didn't know uh, it, he was, it probably depends on the department um he honestly didn't know if like in the, the this very like the, the city's uh, AED, if they had AEDs, then um, I really should have asked random question. We had the, the university cop roll through um, and I really should ask. I was like, I, he didn't have anything. I didn't have any markings on his car for that, but um, or whatever they call them. Um, but, but anyway, I know like I know that's a thing some departments do yeah really cool yeah it is um anyway so that is and then yeah i wrote down mouth guards as well um so on the their first step um i'm gonna go ahead and uh raise the bullshit flag uh because their first step is quickly use the fingers remove anything stuck in the mouth or throat do not do not do this that is a great way to stick it further down their throat and make things way more complicated and fun if you can see it, do it. So uh, you, that your recommendation. So your caveat is don't do a blind sweep. Yeah, don't. Do yeah, a blind don't. Sweep. Don't so just go after it. Yeah, if if it's if it's like in 
in the mouth proper, like by the teeth, go for it. Um Honestly, at that point, I'm more worried about getting bitten reflexively than I am. Yes. Not about. Yes. Yeah, they definitely um, discourage a blind sweep, and they don't specify. Nope. That's I why I. Do. Yeah, because the way they make it seem, just go ahead and stick your finger on in there and get out anything that might be stuck. Um, yeah. Um, I would not do that. Um, you're right. And then mark yeah. in there. they say which is ironic, they teach doing a head tilt chin lift, which is funny because they just talked about C-spine and don't move their neck or back. Um, Shocking though, isn't it? Let's see. Person was jaw thrust. I mean, they're not wrong, of course. Um, yeah. They're actually talking about this as well, this whole concept on um, on the POC podcast as far as like controlling the tongue. Mm-hmm. As far as like if you can get a hold of the tongue, because the tongue is usually what's falling into the airway and mm-hmm. messing you up. It's like if you can grab that tongue, which probably would be a lot easier with some gauze, I think. Like yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. a nasal airway is fantastic. An NPA. Yeah. Right the nose yep. Bypass. That's exactly what they were saying. Like they they uh these guys were talking about it's like the nasal airway is not so much for breathing through as so much as to get the keep the tongue mm-hmm. out. Yep. Which I was like, I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah, that's its main its main job. Yeah, I thought the the early NPAs were they said were solid. Yeah, and then they put a hole through it. He's like, he's like, yeah. If you really think you can breathe through that, go try breathing through that. See how that works. Um, but you know, you learn it, learn something new every day. Hopefully, Mm -hmm. yeah. I like that. that Yeah, Uh, for most for most EMS, if they're doing a BVM and the the patient is unconscious, or if the patient can tolerate, depending on whether or not it's contraindicated. Um, they'll push a push an NBA, an NPA, um, to do a bag valve mask. Um, a lot of them are doing um eye gels and King LTs for unconscious patients. They're doing CPR too. Um, that's like part of their protocol. It's standard, um, especially out here in North Carolina. Um, I talked to a lot of a lot of EMS guys. That's that's pretty pretty common for them um, to push a King LT. Mm. Um, which is just a blind insertion airway device, um, yeah, a supraglottic. A, yeah, it's a non-definitive airway. Mm-hmm. Would be another term for that. I mean, it's like just a definitive airway, just because I used an interesting. <laughs> that's an interesting technical term. What do you mean by that? Um, <laughs> through your through your vocal cords under observation. Yeah, a definitive airway is like all right. This has been observed through your vocal cords through your vocal cords we know it's in your trachea you know in your in your air in, yeah in your bronchus uh in your, your trachea, trachea. In trachea there we go in your yeah, trachea so like it's 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 been visualized <laughs> we know it's through it's not just up against the uh, it's not just up against it's through and, yeah. uh, so, or if you're feeling spicy do a crike <laughs> <laughs> give the surgeon because the surgeons don't have enough to do yeah, well, that's it. that's my job is to make surgeons' lives like more complicated. I just, just you know, just, just uh, you know, uh, what's the what's the term I'm trying to think of? Um, job security. There we go. Yeah. Don't my, make your surgeon hate you. You're my, lucky enough to have one. My phone is <laughs> my, my poor phone on my poor Podbean app is confused. Um, my 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 podcast for committee on tactical combat. Uh, casualty care is borrowed mm-hmm. the same logo as Radio Contra. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. So, by the way, every 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 email I get from you on Patreon, every no every email I get from Patreon has stuck pig medical. It's like even if it's <laughs> from somebody else, so it's like I have to pay attention if you're actually sending something. Pig <laughs> medical. Oh, geez. Um. So yeah. So basically, they're just going through the 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 things for. Um, they say, and again, because they're not using a mask or anything, pinch the nostrils closed with your fingers, open his mouth wide, cover his mouth with yours and blow strongly into his lungs so that chest rises. This is specifically for an adult. Um, and then pause to let the air come back out and blow again. You're just blowing until you see the chest rise and fall with babies and small children, cover the nose and mouth with your mouth and breathe. Very important. Very gently. Once about every three seconds. Do not blow out that little kid's lungs. Yeah, basically you're just trying not to mm-hmm. over like just yeah. until you see as soon as you see that chest wall start to like go up, you're it's like, like yeah. just stop. 
just call it a day. For, for anybody who wants a visual, like remember the last time you over you over inflated a balloon? Yes. Yeah, remember what happened right after? <laughs> Here's your um, visual. Yes. Um yeah, absolutely. That is um extremely yeah, don't don't do that. Um same thing with if you have a, a bag valve mask, if you have a BVM. Um, you don't need to squeeze the whole thing through because a full size BVM, like the adult size, is like two thousand liters. Your tidal volume is only five hundred milliliters for a grown adult. Yeah, I was really proud of one of the students at uh, it was at GCF. He was like, I was talking about using a BVM, and he immediately just holds up like two fingers. He's a big dude. He's mm -hmm. like, and he's doing this, you know, mm -hmm. like you. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I. I Pretty sure it was the the prolonged field care podcast that I, I pulled this from, um, but they recommend, uh, or maybe it was somewhere else. I can't remember. I've, there's a lot of sources that I've pulled stuff it's from the prolonged field care podcast um, or something else or something else. Um, Next gen combat medic, um, medic mindset. One of those um, for adults to use a pediatric BVM because a pediatric BVM is 500 mLs. Oh. Volume and more. your tidal volume is oh uh -huh. oh i wonder can you get i wonder if you can get like the the compact da compactable down one like you can for the adult yeah mr white yes science there we go <laughs> baby yeah i mean if you're gonna if you're telling what if what you're telling me is i have a i have a piece of gear that i can use on the whole population it weighs less and takes up less space I, I like this idea. What I like is better is an anesthesia bag, but you need something that flows mm. to make that work. Unfortunately. Yeah. Well, oxygen concentrators are are they exist? They they are mm -hmm. expensive, but they exist. Yeah. Relatively. Yeah, and some of the some of the bags will will have tubing for oxygen hookups. No, yeah, they should um, a PPDM will because then you can yeah. Into a higher level of, uh, of care. Yeah. And yeah. Before, and, and before the, we get the inevitable question of like, will welding oxygen work? I I don't know. I, I, I no, don't. it's not. It's not filtered. No, it's okay. not. Do not use. The, no, no. <laughs> so do not. Be in, nope. <laughs> some, some, someone's going to wonder that. So uh. it is not filtered. Um, you cannot. That's why, like, um, so people that have worked industrial understand this. You cannot just hook up to any compressed dry airline in a factory and try to breathe through it because you're going to be getting all sorts of metal shavings and mm. the the uh, um, air tool oil is all in there. There's like special filter kits that have to be attached before you can breathe that air. Yeah. So do wow. not try to use welding oxygen. You can go to a scuba shop and, and get scuba tanks refilled. That yeah. is an option. Yeah, I like that is that. that is filtered, clean. That is good, good to. And you can even, I'm pretty sure, for rebreathers, I think you can get 100 percent oxygen. And that's not, and that's not just for for. Uh, I mean, there's there's inland scuba diving too. Yes, there is. There is there is closed water diving. That is a yes. thing. There we go. There we go. Um, so. I almost had a patty shirt. Um, I know a thing or two about a thing or two. Mm -hmm. um so now we get into emergencies caused by heat heat cramps uh while painful they're really not that like they're they're show stopping but they're not like you're not it's gonna a, die it's, it's an inconvenience to get um, out of for heat cramps i mean for all of these heat injuries prevention is generally the best the best thing you can do um so for heat cramps, making sure you're you're getting enough electrolytes. This says because their body lacks salt. It's not just salt. It's it's electrolytes in general. It's it's kind of all of them. Um. So uh, other, treatment. The other side of the oral rehydration discussion. Yeah. Put a teaspoon of salt into a liter of boiled water, and drink it. For them, they're saying boiled water because a lot of times in these third world countries, the water is not very clean. Um, and generally, if it is austere, you should probably be treating your water anyway. And boiling is really simple and easy to do. Um, and then drink it. I wrote in slowly. Don't just chug a whole liter of water if you're dehydrated. You will vomit. I synced it. Um, and then it says repeat once every hour until the cramps are done. Um, have the person sit or lie down in a cool place and gently massage the painful areas. Uh, mustard can help as well. There's a lot of uh. 
I believe, I want to say potassium and magnesium in mustard. Um, uh, that's a good question. Um, but uh, it is something you'll see it done at like football camps and, and, and sports things they'll do. They'll have like little mustard packets or like in their cooler, they'll have a thing of mustard. Mustard does not require refrigeration. Um, so this is not cool. This is not car mustard. This is cooler mustard. Well, you know, it can work as car mustard. Um, so there's been, there's more than just a, a very not so picky, but somewhat picky six year old reasons for having car mustard. There's it's multi use. I was thinking I ahead when mustard. I did this. I want my car mustard uh, tested. Yes. <laughs> uh, and then we have heat exhaustion. What I wrote here um, to differentiate, because um, sometimes, and I definitely struggle with this for a while, that it was between heat exhaustion and heat stroke until I saw it um, in person, was heat exhaustion is cool and moist and mild. Um, so those are like the two like things to keep in mind is that heat exhaustion is cool and moist. It's not that bad. Um, heat stroke, they're going to be hot and dry and they're probably going to have loss of consciousness or at least altered mental status. They're going to be confused. Um, and heat stroke is very dangerous. Yeah, you, heat you've stroke gone is very, very, very dangerous. dangerous. Yes. If you're, sweating, if you're sweating, your body is, is compensating. If you can no longer yeah. sweat, you've gone past your, your body's ability to compensate. Yep. Your body can no longer maintain homeostasis. Like a it's like a cirrhotic patient with normal liver values. Mm -hmm. Those values are not normal. <laughs> okay. Um, so this has so there's no more fuel. <laughs> Signs for heat exhaustion: person who works and sweats a lot in hot weather may become very pale, weak, and nauseous, and perhaps feel faint. Skin is cool and moist. Pulse is rapid and weak. Temperature of the body may rise, but it's usually normal. Have them lay down, raise their feet, salt water to drink. Um, so when I was doing um more like blue collar work what i would keep in my toolbox um is i had a little one of the little camper uh salt and pepper shakers like a little combo one that's like two in together and one side and they have like screw caps on both i just filled both sides up with uh sea salt and i would just sprinkle not a lot not enough to where it really changed the taste but i would like do like a sprinkle or two into my Nalgene, like a full liter of water and would do that throughout like anytime i filled my water bottle up i put a little bit of salt in and, you know, in a non air conditioned, like metal building in eastern North Carolina in the middle of summer through August and July, I, I didn't have any any issues. We had a guy that was starting to get almost heat strokey. He was definitely in heat exhaustion and was having him sip water. And I put a little bit of salt in it and he drastically like his his mental status changed, like turned around within 10, 15 minutes. Um important you just have to stay on you just have to stay on the right side of it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and that's why I, like i said very very little small amounts not a lot if there's enough to taste a difference it's too much um mm. so just just small amounts um heat stroke it's not common uh question mark mm, source bro uh it's very common um especially in hot and humid environments you're going to see a bunch of it ask me how i know um, and this says it occurs, especially in older, very fat people and alcoholics during hot weather. That's probably why we saw a lot of it. Um, because also, we, also, it, it, we had all three of those in the guard. It also occurs in, um, in public events in Charlottesville adjacent to sports cars. <laughs> yes. Yes, it does. Um, so skin is red, very hot and dry. Not even the armpits are moist. The person is a very high fever, sometimes more than 42 degrees Celsius. In a rapid heartbeat, he is often con unconscious. Treatment. The body temperature must be lowered immediately. So I wrote, like, the first thing you're going to want to do is remove any sort of restrictive clothing. Get their boots off of them. Get a hat off of them. Undo their belt. Untuck their shirt. If they're wearing, like, a, a collared shirt, unbutton it. Um, put them in the shade. And they put soak them with cold water. I line that out and wrote cool. And they have ice water if possible. Do not. Do not use ice water we used to use ice dunks ice baths don't do it just don't it's a bad idea it's it's a uh, it's too much of a thermal shock and can be very dangerous for their central nervous system um because yeah, you risk a lot of load in their heart too yes that too a lot of cardiac load we were able to get away with it relatively easily because we had for the most part healthy in relatively decent shape adult males 
Mm -hmm. Um, but you get outside of that and the chances of that, like still being a thing are very, very slim. So do not use cold water. Do not use ice water. Cool them with cool, like room temp, 70 degree water, um, fan them because what you're doing with the fanning them and soaking them is you're creating evaporative cooling. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a little bit harder in more human environments, but it's still possible. Um, and continue until the fever drops, seek medical help. Um, and then they've got a little diagram with the difference between um, heat exhaustion and heat stroke, which is all the stuff we we talked about. Um, they include large pupils. Uh, there's going to be way more obvious. Like the, the skin's going to get red. Like, and I mean, like, like noticeably red. Um and the other thing is, it's going to be hot and dry compared to cool and moist. So they're not going to they're they're going to be they're not sweating anymore. And um, for heat stroke, they're going to be altered mental status. They're going to be confused. They're not going to be aware of what's going on. Um. So yeah, that's that's really. Um. Definitely a a concern. Um. I've I've treated lots of of heat stroke. Yeah, I I'm just so I I'm just chuckling to myself about some of the some of the more blue states where they don't want you to have disposable grocery bags and the irony of it's probably easier to get disposable disposable gloves in the in the states than it is to get mm-hmm. the improvised version. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> uh, but I've I've seen plenty of of heat stroke and heat exhaustion. Um, they can change quick. Um, heat exhaustion can become heat stroke very very quickly. Uh, and like we talked about, like prevention is the biggest, like the best way to handle this. Um, and so taking breaks, not trying to overwork yourself, um, timing your breaks around like the the hottest part of the one thing we did when we were at mississippi for annual training which is the miserable miserable place to do annual training i feel bad for the national guard units that have to live there full time um but what our unit did is from like noon to four we did training indoors in air-conditioned spaces um because it's just it's so hot and we're we weren't really we didn't have a chance to acclimate fully to the temperature. So I, I look I look at that though and the just pure bath you know, just pure bastard in me um thinks about like if I have if I had to fight the PLA in Mississippi, I would want to fight them during the during the hottest, most humid. Oh part. yeah, absolutely. I want to acclimate and like like I just want yeah. to make them have to chase me. <laughs> yeah. So that that if we had had time to acclimate, we wouldn't have been doing that. But that was during the acclimatization period before we went out into the field. We yeah. were from twelve to four. No, like nobody, like motor pool empty. There is not a soul inside that motor pool because uh, it's just a big gravel pit of heat and despair. Um, yeah, so I mean, for 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 people living, or not just the South, but anybody who lives in a not entirely ideal environment, yeah, it's good to keep in mind that your home field advantage is at the maximum when you when your invader just got there, mm-hmm. out from a similar region. Yep, and haven't acclimated yet. Yeah, it's like the more time they have to get to learn the region, even if the climate isn't an issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they get to know the look. Yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah. That home field advantage does does start to evaporate the longer the longer yeah. that invasion lasts. Yeah, that's, um, that's fair. To some, yeah, there are other factors, but yeah. So now we get into how to control bleeding from a wound. You wouldn't know anything about this. This is I'm gonna get angry at a lot of this. Um, Shut up and let you talk. <laughs> <laughs> so. Raise the injured part. Um, and they talk about pressure points. Pressure points do work. Um, they actually work pretty well because generally pressure points are also along, um, like right next to blood vessels. So that that is an option. 
but elevation really doesn't do much of of anything for for stopping bleeding um not enough to map by the time it like might do something you're it's it's not especially for really heavy arterial blood flow like if you get like if your brachial gets severed or nicked just holding your arm up isn't going to do anything um and by the time it might do something it's too late you wait until um if you wait to apply direct pressure until you find and i and i'll quote this military term a rock or something <laughs> if you know you know um yes. then that's not the right answer yeah and then they say with a clean thick cloth or your hand if there is no cloth press directly on the wound wrong answer wrong answer you're we're not pressing on the wound we're not that's not that doesn't do anything we need to press at the source of the bleeding that's how wound packing works pressing yeah. on the wound does nothing so uh, on the subject of pressure points it would be upstream of the wound. yes yes pressure points more proximal to use a medical term uh to the bleed um or from the bleed um so this says keep pressing until the bleeding stops this may take 20 minutes and i wrote death or sometimes an hour or more um that i what if it's taking you 20 minutes to stop a bleed dude holy crap um if i just throw a tourniquet on a call it a day at the bottom i they put precautions using a tourniquet to stop the bleeding and they put usually so i lined that out in pen and wrote rarely results in total loss of the arm or leg only use a tourniquet if you have no other option never use a string or a wire that is true do not do that uh yeah. a string or a wire that's not a tourniquet that's called a garrote um that is how spies in bad spy movies kill people and how spies in real life kill people um, <laughs> is is with garrotes. Um, it's also how like mobsters, like the so, piano wire. Like so that is how you is that the real world is a bad movie. Yes, it is. I, I, we are I, in a I bad movie right now. I, yeah, I, I I agree with we you. We are. We are yeah, we're in a bad movie right now, and I don't like it, and I want it to end. Um, I want off this ride. No thanks. I'm done. Someone else can have the rest of my fair tokens. Um, uh, so, so, okay. Um, yeah. So, like, not, yeah. Um, okay. So, as opposed to that, they, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. They so even show putting pressure. direct pressure on like an amputation stump. Like, it, no, it's not going to, it's not going to fucking do anything. Yeah. Like, that is not like throw a tourniquet on and call it a day. And if you don't have like, like okay, let's say you have to improvise a tourniquet. I mean, what you basically have to do is put some sort of durable material. The wider, the better, just for comfort and honestly being able to achieve hem hemostasis with minimal amount of pressure applied. Mm -hmm. Generating a fresh injury, right? Um, and some sort of windlass. So you some some sort of way yeah. to apply uh, that twist uh, you know, torsion. Um, yeah. to, to that device and hold it in place so i mean that was i can't remember i want to say they said like again it's going back to the, the improvised medicine episodes of prolonged field care podcast um i want to say like the width of your palm or twice the width of your palm or something like that is like it's it's it, it wants to be you want it to be good and wide yeah two um, to four inches um yeah. the cotsy minimum um is inch and a half originally um before they started recommending tourniquets this is like way back was two inches the reason they changed it from two to inch and a half is because the cat tourniquet is an inch and a half yeah i mean um, i would even say but like, two to four I'm, inches when i would err more towards that four inch mark yeah, so i would just err on the side of of wide because if i'm using material that i don't know the tensile strength of mm -hmm. i want to spread that pressure not just for the tissue yeah not just for pressure um, not just for reducing pain i don't want to load and let's say a, yeah. let's, say a tear, let's say a tear a piece of cloth out of my sleeve yeah I'm much more willing to trust a six inch wide piece of cloth than to not bust yeah. than yeah. In, yeah, you're you're spreading that load out across a, a wider area. Um, physics. Um, 
the the old military manuals um like the first aid manuals and stuff like that talk about because everybody had them was using the cravats and those are 100 percent cotton um, yeah. yeah and you can yeah. like they come folded at like a, a like basically like the same width um as yeah. a, a deck of cards you and others um, have, have, have really said good things about the cravats as far as like you can make your own char. You can make a sling. You can do it. You can do a lot of things with them. Yeah. Yeah, I love, uh, especially U.S. Not like the as much as I like North American Rescue. Um, I don't like their cravats. They're they're they just feel thinner and they're a little bit more rough. I like the USGI ones, like the old school muslin bandage cravats. Um, especially after you you throw them in the washer. Oh, buddy. Do those things get soft? I used to keep one folded up in a cargo pocket because um, I could use them for all sorts of stuff. They were I would use them on convoys um, if I was TCing a track, um, especially in the desert. Or you know, um, it keep there's the dust that. out of my face. It's it's really crazy how a simple piece of cloth has so many uses. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I, so I I will say on improvised tourniquets, they have a fifty percent fail rate um just in testing so keep that in mind probably um, right about the time you move the casualty yeah generally um so if you're if you're if you're planning to if you're failing to plan you're planning to fail and i'm not gonna yeah, so plan it's, it's to something that you should know how to do and be comfortable yeah. doing it, it's not unlike some of my friends who told me this it's like i it's not sufficient to say oh well i don't need to buy a tourniquet or have one yeah commercial tourniquet because i can always improvise one it's like i respect your level of skill but even so if i need something i'm just going to use the thing that's honestly not something i want to have time take tight time improvising of all yeah Mm -mm. no no um seconds is is blood no yeah yeah it, it it takes a lot less than 20 minutes <laughs> to die from blood loss. Well, I mean, it takes it, take, it takes what is like three minutes to bleed out. It takes a lot less than that to lose consciousness, or you can't yeah. use your own aid, and that's what people De- don't talk about. Depending on the artery that gets hit and the size right. of the right. cut, it can take as little as a minute and a half. Yeah, but again, um, like that's not even like it's just people talk about. Oh, it takes this long to bleed out to where you die. It's like yeah, but if you're doing your own care. Yeah, you're not conscious you for your, yeah, you lost for conscious. most of that time, like less yeah. than half of that time that's, you're conscious. That's, that's what they're not talking about, you know. You just you go to sleep, no more dreams now. Shh. Yeah. Yeah. No fight. Um so they do say so I yeah, I do agree do not use string or a wire that's going to um or rats never use those. Um never use dirt, kerosene, lime or coffee to stop bleeding. That just I I have questions. Um, so many well, questions on the, on the on the dirt thing. I mean, kaolin clay is yeah the active ingredient in quick clot gauze. Dirt. I mean, it's not clean. I mean, the dirt you know throwing dirt in a wound is not yeah. Clean. I grant you. Yeah. Um, I I told mm-hmm. you about I told you about watching that episode of that TV show where they're using like clay with black mustard in it for a bleed right i think so yeah that is the uh hell on wheels yes, like, yes reminds yes, me yes. a lot of cowlin clay and cayenne yeah i don't know if it's the same deal but that's what it yeah reminds me. and then when bleeding or injury is severe raise the feet and lower the head to prevent shock yeah that's not going to do what you think it's going to do um and the argument i heard for why trendelenburg doesn't work for hemorrhagic shock is what is the first thing your body does in shock with your lower extremities, it pulls blood out of them. Anyway. Starts shunting. Yeah, it shunts blood preferentially to the to the brain anyway. Yeah. It, I, yeah. And then keep blood from getting into any cuts or sores in your skin. Yeah, use gloves, 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 gloves for this. I could not imagine how. You know what? I might try it at the next class. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna get a bag. And see how easily I can pack a wound with a what looks like a grocery bag over my hands. Oh yeah, yeah. Do it at PLS. I want to see this. This is miserable. 
Oh, that is a heck. That is a heck of a YouTube video. Yeah. We'll just bad put, like, ideas. Some, like, I, I think this is going to probably call for like some um, Keystone Cops music running in the background. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mac Man curses. curses <laughs> yes. In the yeah, I definitely need to uh, just have it completely bleaked down, just running a train of every special character in every language possible on, on the screen. <laughs> just a little, just so a, much more entertaining. Yeah, just a streak of blue. <laughs> um, all yes. right. How about nosebleeds? Cocaine. I mean, it. they do talk about lidocaine, um, which is in the same family. Yeah, but cocaine is, you know, I mean, mm, mm, mean, the beauty of cocaine. Well, this does say to use lidocaine with epi. Yeah, it's the epi, it's not the lido. Yeah. Well, unlike, I don't know if lidocaine works this way, but cocaine will turn off uh, security cameras in the White House. So there is that. (laughs) Yeah, hit up your local dentist for cocaine. (laughs) I didn't know this I'm not going to go to a dentist for cocaine. It's so much easier to just go to a a uh, car dealership and talk to the service manager. Um, <laughs> oh, um, um, like it's the one the the the, the nosebleed. I think is the one legitimate use that I know yes. of. Yeah. So sit quietly and upright, blow the nose gently to remove bu- mucus and blood, and have the person pinch the nose firmly for 10 minutes or until bleeding has stopped. What I was told is you want to have them to pinch like higher up on the nose, not like at the base, but like right and where like the cartilage stops. And that way they, they blow they blow the nose so that any clot that might have already been forming gets to come out and we can yeah, yeah, yeah. blood. Yeah. We can just reset that clotting cascade it, 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 after just, just, yeah, yeah. the anti-clotting clotting factor has already started to work its way through. Yeah, quality. Uh, yep. the, the other things that need to go, okay. I wouldn't want mucus in my clot. Has anyone heard of nasal precautions? Uh, I'm sure I should have. Probably not in relation to anything positive. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> um, basically, Sounds like something I should I should be aware of at the elephant cage at the zoo. Probably. Um, I, I'd love to see a, a, an NPA for an elephant. Um, it's like I'm just thinking like a little trunk that comes out of the cage and starts rummaging around my pocket looking for peanuts. <laughs> uh, or a paintbrush. Anyway, sorry. But uh, no, nasal, yes. nasal precautions being just so a, a, a series of things to keep in mind with a bad nosebleed or any kind of nasal surgery or brain surgery that goes through the face or you get the picture anything that disrupts the, that delicate thing that you sniff through yeah like um, kind of pituitary surgery would count yep yeah. yep yeah. um yeah so um you're what you're doing is you're avoiding putting pressure on your sinuses for lack of a better term no bending over from the waist um so, so yeah absolutely no bending over from the waist uh no sneezing with your mouth closed it's like you actually need to consciously think about sneezing with your mouth open here's a trick if you really can't do that stick your tongue on the roof of your mouth as hard as you can a it will almost force your mouth open but b it might actually cut off that sneeze Hmm. um it interrupts the the neural processing that initiates a sneeze Hmm. Um, i've always just like like pushed on the 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 septum and then it's like stopped yeah but it's got, if you have a delicate nose you don't really want to do that um it, so you don't, you, you don't necessarily want to be Fair. going that far down on the nose yeah but yeah but it's like no just, medic- yes my delicate nose that's yeah that's the yeah first that's thing someone says to me when they first meet me in person yes a delicate nose yeah it yeah. doesn't really disrupt it either either purposefully or, or not he doesn't box that much uh, <laughs> but uh yeah bad nose later surgery that's all we're going with here guys so my question is uh, like do you do you look at like stool softeners so they don't like really bear down yeah. hard for yeah. a bowel movement yeah wow like, after any, surgery, any of that kind of thing um, huh. yeah, yeah. um thought about yeah. that all right going to post any surgery um and then more, kind of more obviously relating to the nose this with a nosebleed or a recent nasal surgery this is not someone you put a nasal airway in just saying yeah <laughs> our cannula is okay no nope. okay so they probably dry it out too much 
Yeah, yeah. really nothing. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a nothing in the nose. Um, and like no suction in the nose. So like when you've got someone yeah. who needs secretions. Mm-hmm. Um. So, try to suck stuff out through the mouth or what yeah you can so okay amendment you can do like a bulb syringe suction okay but, but not the wall suction do, there's a one certain type of wall suction you can do but that requires a, a very specific catheter um yeah. and like that's just getting into like having, having to have lots of stuff on hand but it's like bulb syringe is a safer bet because it's more applicable people can easily get them they're safe i'm guessing it's a fenestrated catheter so not all the suctions coming out right at the end uh, I think a red rubber has two openings. Um, a Dali definitely does. Uh, but it's more to the point, it's just, it's really, really soft and malleable and about a foot long. Oh, okay. uh, so, it, so it's like you can just run it down someone's mouth and a healthy person with an intact nose, you can just run it down the, na- the, the, the nasal passages and into the back of the throat. Mm. Um, it's a very common mechanism of suctioning neonates mm. uh, or like cerebral palsy patients that have a really hard time with secretions. Um, but, but yeah my nasal precautions are like don't shove anything in the stupid nose don't put a lot of pressure through it um yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's like remind people don't bend over if you're on a, you need to get something on the floor you squat um and right. yeah don't blow the nose <laughs> all right so mm, I have off. go ahead yeah, no, I was just saying, yeah, putting a, a wad of cotton, leaving part of it outside the nose, if possible, yeah. first wet it with Vaseline. I'm assuming so it's easier to remove. You don't have to worry about, like, taking scabs and clots out with it. Right, and keeping things moist. Uh, yeah. I'm, guessing, I'm guessing the lidocaine with Epi is like, well, the Epi is there to try to get those blood vessels to mm-hmm. shut up. Vasoconstrictors. Um, something that's really good for packing in the nasal and oral cavities, especially oral, just because it's bulkier, but, uh, but, but it's like, I mean, obviously for nasal, when you got something real small, you can use just a strip of Carlax gauze, uh, just have the whole roll and use a teeny little pair of forceps, just keep shoving it in there. Mm-hmm. Um, if you, if you don't have like something designed to do that, you designed to go in there and pack. But if you're talking packing in the oral cavity, like you have someone who lost a tooth and they won't stop bleeding or whatever else, as long as they can protect their airway, meaning they can still swallow, talk to you in full sentences, they can cough, whatever, uh, then you can actually, like some of the best packing, this is what ENTs do, is postpartum hemorrhage packing. Um, Mm -hmm. It sounds utterly disgusting when you know what it is, (laughs) but the stuff is clean. (laughs) Some things folks just don't want to know about. (laughs) Yeah, the stuff is clean and it's a lot of bulk and it's designed to absorb. So yeah. it's like you can, and it's designed to work with with very elasticated spaces. So it's it's and it has a string on the end, so you don't lose it and they can't swallow it. Oh yeah. So it's like the point being, you leave the string hanging out the mouth, <laughs> and it's all one piece, so they physically can't swallow and choke on it. Or if they start to, you grab the string and yank. Yeah. <laughs> and and you you protect their airway that way. That's good because I I don't even I'm not even familiar with. Well, I've probably seen that kind of packing before. I don't it's literally just one patch pack. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, all right. Something about for like older people, you're supposed to put a corn cob in their mouth or something. What? Um, yeah, and then have them oh, lean forward. Because this is supposed to doesn't work. The pinching in the nose doesn't help as much. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that's about. Um Yeah. I'm assuming that the that the thing in their teeth is more to get them to bite down, and that that probably the pressure on the maxilla, that the top that that bone right behind the top layer of your teeth. Uh, it's saying it's to keep them from swallowing, and that gives oh. a chance for the blood to clot. Oh, okay. I could have just kept reading. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, was, have... I was coming up with this really complicated mechanism, <laughs> not swallow. Yeah. This is a problem I had with math. I didn't read the directions. <laughs> um, and we have prevention. If a person's no- nose bleeds often, smear a little Vaseline inside the nostrils twice a day or sniff water with a little salt in it. Eating oranges, tomatoes, and other fruits may help to strengthen the vein so that the nose bleeds less. Um also, if they're taking any sort of like antihistamine and it becomes more dry outside, you might want to have them like stop. Um, I know someone that moved from a really humid area to a more dry area and was still taking 
antihistamines and ended up um, like fainting and passing out um, because everything got so dry that it messed with their um, vestibular system mm. and mm. they lost balance and they just like got like woozy and just fainted mm. um, and they stopped taking uh, Benadryl and they became better. They didn't have that issue anymore. So just something to keep in mind as well. Um, but the the little Vaseline inside the nostrils can definitely help. Um, and you'll definitely see more like nosebleeds and stuff like that, like in the winter time, because it definitely gets a lot more dry because that yeah. cold pulls a lot of moisture out of the air. Is that something you've noticed more living uh, in Eastern Standard Time rather than where you used to live? Um season to season no because there were still changes um especially um like it would get super dry during the winter time um because it was getting so cold and like yeah. snow and it would just suck everything out yeah because it um, starts to be dry yeah there's in the rain shadow yeah um it still gets there's still there's still some humidity. I mean, it's not like a desert like in eastern Washington. It's yeah. it's still fairly humid, um, just not as humid as like Portland. Right. It's like I remember like or Southern Seattle. Idaho, just like yeah. it was not a huge amount of difference. Of course, I've never really been real susceptible to that. Yeah. Um, it's not. And it's it yeah, it's it's not as as varying as it is here in eastern North Carolina or in North Carolina in general. Um, but there still was a little bit of fluctuation, but there's more so here. Like our our summers are unbelievably humid. Um and and winters are like this last winter working in a warehouse. I mean, I was I was having to like actually like put lotion on daily because my skin, like my legs and my arms were just getting like so dry that it was like cracking the skin. And like mm, if I wasn't yeah, paying that's... attention, I would almost start bleeding. Yeah, that's annoying. I'm like my my knuckles. Yeah. Yep, mm -hmm. my knuckles were just like so it hurt, um, and I hated it. Not not as good a transition as the watcher on the web will do for us over a receipt. <laughs> Speaking of cut scrapes and small wounds, so before we get into that, um, we've been going on for two and a half hours, um, and we still have like three or four more pages to go before we get to our supposed stopping point for this. I think that this is probably a good stop we'll probably have to turn this into three sections uh, um at, at the very least um so I, we've I got think, some really important guidance at the bottom of page 84 uh well that'll just have yes to that'll on. yeah that's that's uh because this is already a, a very a very lengthy uh, this is already yeah. like two hours yes um and change and we've yeah. been on for a lot more than two hours um, <laughs> um so well if, if people can either look at look at page 84 themselves or wait and <laughs> for a yeah. critical advice on wound care mm -hmm. um so with that we will go ahead and call this for today any other comments or concerns from anyone um I have to open these before I lose the links. Oh. Thoma is uh is is opening up their yes labs and lectures yes. applications. So they're they're gonna be putting together that kind of stuff. Um it's like at the risk of flooding Soma with <laughs> a, a, a bunch of us goons. Um that is one of those things, guys. It's it's in May. Um, I can't remember exactly. It's like early half of May. It's basically a week of lectures and labs. It's pricey. Um, yes. You get stuff that if you have, if you're at least an EMT basic, um, you can go there without being a member of SOMA. Um, and you can get some exposure to some things. It's not going to get you a certification. It's not going to blah, blah, blah. But if you're here, you're probably just mostly here for the information anyway. So uh, I know Mech and I are planning on going again next year and probably just, I, I want to do even more. Um, yeah. Be there like full time the entire week and just 
I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, with the, with spreading the word, we can just, uh, basically get Soma to say like, all right, all right. Okay. No more civilians. I'm like, no, <laughs> we're done. Um, this whole buy with and through the local population. We, we only mean that overseas. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's just something to think about. Um, yeah, they will, they'll probably open the reg- registration up in February. Yeah. Uh, and then other things I continue to work through and work on this paper. Uh, just kind of doing my, we're going to do a digest of that. Uh, that yeah. should, won't, it won't, it honestly won't provide a lot of answers. It just raises the right questions. Yeah. To think about. Um, and something, and again, I just think this is the last thing I'm going to think. I think um, when it comes to social media, something I've noticed is people get into silos like based on age group i've been listening to this podcast and like every guest on this podcast is somebody that the host can't contacted through instagram yep because that's his generation's preferred social media yeah and based on what they talk about like there seems to be a clear ignorance of any previous generations or previous work on mm-hmm. the radios and stuff like that um so again, just try to try to make sure you're getting a breadth of different inputs mm-hmm. um, as much as you can. You know, we've talked about the Gorilla Medic podcast. He's over there. He's got a YouTube channel. Uh, we've talked about the Altons. Um, they, they've they've got their own stuff going on. Um, like those, the Herbal Medic is out there. I don't know much about it. I think all their classes are are. I don't know how much free content they put out. Um, but you know, like it's. I mean, it's. I mean, I, I'm. If you're if you're here listening to this, you're probably interested in those things as well. So, trying to get multiple inputs and multiple voices um, in the multitude yeah. of counselors, there is there is safety. I believe is the the diverse. But anyway, that's that was my thought. Try try to avoid an echo chamber. Um, in the yeah. just stay away from crowds. And that's not just literal crowds. That's avoid group think as much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm excited for for us to do. We we'll be talking about that that uh, that that paper. Um, I'm gonna get a link up on I'm gonna throw it up as a PDF on my on my site uh, so that other people can can read through it. It's it's there's some some interesting stuff in it. It lays kind of a, a a good framework if you don't understand the military roles, uh, medical care. Um, it lays that out really well, um, which is great for reading through some of the military manuals and some of the FMs and, and TMs um, on on medical care. It, it if you have an understanding of it going in, it makes things a lot easier to understand. Um, but it's really applicable to us um, in in a very specific like subset of medical care. Um, but we'll, we'll get into that when we, when we go over the paper in general, um, but I'm excited for that. That's really cool. Um, go that we get the out, opportunity to do that. Go check out council on future conflict. Yes. Them too. They're, those guys are doing some really, really cool stuff over there. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't have anything else. If you guys don't have anything else. All right. Well, thank you guys for stopping by and listening to another episode. I apologize. We had way too many side roads to go down that we couldn't get as far, but there was a lot of good conversation and a lot of good, as always, a lot of good stuff that was talked about. So appreciate it and catch you guys on the next one. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stuck Pig Academy of Medicine. If you'd like to join the Patreon, the link is in the show notes. Also, check out my training calendar for in-person classes. We'd love to have you. It's a damn shame what the world's gotten to for people like me, people like you. Wish I could just wake up and it not be true, but it is. Oh, it is living in the world with an old soul. The rich men know the rich men, Lord knows.